story time. I was going up on a solo trip into the mountains. It was around minus 12 to minus 15 degrees Celsius and there was a heavy storm with 15 meters per second wind and whiteout. It was 9 p.m. and with the shitty snow drift weather making the visibility be max 15 meters, I knew I was the only person crazy enough to venture out to this mountain. Well, this was unknown terrain for me, never visited the whole region. I had scouted out the environment on a map and figured out a decent campsite up in a pass which was flatter terrain and with a few nice ridges that should protect pretty well from avalanches. I kept on looking at the GPS and knew I was closing into my designated campsite when I found one of the ridges. As I'm going over the edge of the ridge looking down, looking as much as it's possible, visibility at this point is probably around 7 meters, into the small sheltered area between the ridges, I hear a sound that I can best describe as Rua. I immediately froze. My mind was brainstorming at full speed, WTF was that? Definitely not a human. Reindeer? Did it sound like reindeer? There's not many animals around in this type of environment in winter. Could it be a bird maybe? Meanwhile, another thought started growing in my head, I'm not that far from that area where muskox roam free. Please, do not be muskox, those will charge at people if you get too close. The sound was not more than 10 to 30 meters from me. At the same time, I'm trying to look into every direction I can, because with the winds blowing around in the pass from different directions, I have no idea from where I heard the sound at first. Then it hits me again, Brua. My thoughts spin faster, that sound I've never heard before. That is definitely no reindeer. Nope. Almost demon-like, but, thankfully those don't exist. Muskox? Quite likely. The difference this time is that I knew the direction of the sound when I heard it, it came right from this sheltered area between the ridges, and I'm still standing on top of the ridge. Next set of thoughts, there is nothing that can provide shelter for me here, nothing. If a muskox charges at me I will not be able to outrun it, and there is nowhere for me to go. I need to speed away into the opposite direction of this sound, fast as hell. If I can quickly set up my tent, a muskox should likely ignore the tent. I hope. I'm heading away from the area where I heard the muskox, looking as good as I can forward, to the sides and turning around to look backwards now and then. I find a flat and nice spot and I notice the wind is a little bit less on this spot. I step around the spot for a few seconds and feel that the wind is overall a bit less in an area that would fit my tent, so I decide that it is a perfect spot for my tent. I throw off my backpack and gear, pick up the tent, and look backwards to where I had heard the sound. Through the snow drift I'm not sure what I'm seeing. I see a large shadow, just faintly. Does it move? or is it the snow and wind that is moving around it? I'm staring into the snowdrift for 20 seconds, but I'm just not sure if there is a huge animal watching me or not. I decide that my best option is to fast as hell get my tent up. Inside it I will likely be hidden from view. While setting up the tent I constantly look back towards the shadow to see if it has disappeared, but every time I look behind myself, it's still there. Is it a muskox? Could it be a rock? I walked very closely to that spot on my way to my tent spot, so I should have seen a rock, right? Has it moved since last time? I'm not sure. Better finish the tent setup. As soon as my tent is up I move all my gear inside and close the tent and feel sheltered. But the sounds the wind is making with the tent garment are crazy. There's cracks, booms and constant shattering sounds. Was that a step from a heavy animal or was it the tent garment? Was that the sound of a large animal breathing out, very close to the tent? I get ready for the night and head into my sleeping bag. I pick out my snow shovel and ice axe and place them right next to me. Just in case. Something is scratching on my tent. Or, is it just the wind? I'm not sure about anything anymore. I keep on listening to all the sounds and try to figure them out for about an hour. I've heard so many heavy footsteps, muskox? Near me, I've heard scratching so many times, lemmings? Mice? Wolves? 
that I'm just not sure if it just is the tent garment playing tricks with my mind or if there are animals that are interested in my tent. My mind goes haywire for half an hour more and then I finally fall asleep. My wife, dog and I were camping for outfits tea time on Antelope Island, Salt Lake City. We pulled in and found a pull-in campsite that was available. At the campsite there was large pea gravel area and then long grass surrounded it. We noticed a spot in the grass that had matted down and thought grass would be more comfortable than sleep on rocks, so we set up our tent in this grass depression thinking someone else had set their tent up there before. We got there in the early afternoon and and went to the hiking trails to tire out the dog and see the sights. On the way to the trailhead we noticed there aren't many or any other tent campers, mostly RVs and that that was kinda weird, but attributed it to the crazy amount of biting gnats around. We get out on the oath and see some bison off in the distance. Also thought that was weird because on the drive and we saw some but they were behind fence and our original thought was the bison were secluded from the camping areas, but we chalked it up to no big deal and our assumption about secluding the bison was wrong and they must be no big deal or threat. We hike out a mile or two on the path that rides close to the shore of the salt lake. At the beginning of the hike we see another depression in the grass where someone was doing some rogue camping not at the defined sites. We decide to turn back and we're maybe half a mile from the campsite and a stupid bison is on the path and he is laying down where that matted down grass area was. May I remind you that there is three or four foot high grass surrounding the path. So I tell my wife to wait and the dog and approach the beast to see if we can pass. The bison stands up and starts huffing at us, oh boy was my heart racing, doggo acting scared but tough. We back up and as a family walk through the nasty razor grass about 30 from the beast. We had no other choice since this was the only way to the campsite. Phew, we made it. Later that night after we've gone to bed, doggo wakes us up, with a growl and her hackles up. I try to calm her down and listen to what's going on. I hear movement on the pea gravel and huffing. Oh crap. I wake up the wife, deep sleeper, tell her what's going on, and take a peek outside the tent. The bison is right there. Not four feet from out tent and kind of between us and our car. We sprint to the car and start driving around the park trying to figure out what to do. It is 2 AM in the morning. We get back to our site and the bison has moved out of the gravel area but is still close by. I packed up the tent faster than ever before and we get out of there. I guess we were in his nest. And now I never hesitate to have a bison burger. When I was about 8 years old I was taking my dog for a walk through the neighborhood with my mom. It was maybe 11 p.m. We live next to a swamp slash woods area on the edge of our neighborhood in Lansing, Michigan. I remember it being very silent and slightly windy. From down in the swamp we heard somebody whistling at us. It sounded sort of like a bird, but each whistle was different enough where the lack of consistency made it human-like. The whistle sounded higher, then lower. I can't really describe it. My mom had a concerned, slightly terrified look on her face and grabbed my hand and said that we should go inside quickly. I didn't understand because I was too young, but seeing my mom freak out made me freak out too. After a while, though, I kind of forgot about it. Two years later, I was taking my dog out again, late at night. There is a large bush that could easily obscure a person behind it just next to the front door. As I was finishing the walk, the whistling noise started again, same pitches, same inconsistent, human-like tones. As soon as I heard it, a chill went down my spine as I remembered exactly the feeling of seeing my mom, terrified, looking down into the swamp at something I couldn't see, maybe she couldn't either. I ran inside as fast as possible. Years went by and I thought about it less and less. I told only a handful of people, and eventually it slipped from my mind. Fast forward to last summer, I'm 24, started dating my girl Sarah. We moved out to South Dakota for work. For Independence Day, 
we decided to go to Pierre, South Dakota and watch the fireworks along the bank of the Missouri River. There was a free camping spot behind a hospital where you could pitch your tent, hang out, and see the fireworks up the river. We were near the end of the campground and there were very few people around us. As it was getting dark, the fireworks began. They were pretty far away, so the illumination they brought was very little. Thus, we had to sit right at the edge of the river to be able to see them. A huge thunderhead was moving in and a storm was imminent, so the air seemed electric and the wind was picking up. The atmosphere was eerie to say the least. The police boats herded all the other boats off of the river and had left our area to do that elsewhere. Most of the other campers walked up the river to have a better view of the fireworks, but Sarah and I stayed back and were drinking PBR tall boys and kicking it. Suddenly, we heard the sound of a paddle methodically dipping into the water. We saw a figure steering a canoe about 20 meters offshore. Sarah decided to go get more beers from the car, leaving me alone to stare at this mystery person. And then, of course, they whistled at me. My entire body was frozen and covered in goosebumps. It was the exact same whistler from my childhood, more than a decade earlier. I looked at the figure, but it was much too dark to discern who it could be. They were wearing a hat. When they were perpendicular to the shore from me, they stopped paddling, turned the canoe to face directly at me, and whistled right at me. I was so frightened I stood up and shouted at them who are you? They didn't say anything, just whistled a couple more times, turned the canoe 180 degrees, and paddled out of sight. I'm a videographer, so I already had my camera by my side and was taking video of the fireworks. As the canoe was almost out of sight, I grabbed my camera and got a shot of them whistling as they went away. When Sarah came back from getting beers, she was very confused as to why I was so freaked out. When I explained, she was freaked out a bit too. I was convinced we would both be murdered that night. How did this whistling person follow me, after 14 years, all the way to South Dakota? Was it a coincidence? Why was it the same whistling noise? Who was that person and where did they go? So many questions still unanswered. To this day I'm more afraid of being outside in the dark where I might hear that whistling again. I'm open to any explanations. When I was 10 my extended family brought my cousins up from the city. We were riding bikes around a road, in the Adirondack Park, and we saw a raccoon. I had alarm bells going off because this was the 90s and quicksand and rabies seemed to be the two deadliest things ever at the time. Also, we had just read Old Yeller in school or some other sad dog dying award winning book. My cousins were oblivious and just excited to see a raccoon even if it was the afternoon. I kept trying to get them to leave but they thought it was too funny. To be fair it was moving crap around with its tiny hands and muttering to itself like a drunk bitter old man. I started whispering rabies but they didn't know what it was. I couldn't believe it didn't turn at us because my dumbass cousins were being so loud. Eventually some small bunny slash cat sized animal caught its eye and its movements were like something from a horror film. It turned and instantly lunged at it without hesitation, like its only option was fight and it was all adrenaline. I had never seen anything like it. My cousins freaked out and were traumatized as this raccoon ripped whatever that was apart. I took off and they finally got the message that it was dangerous and followed me. Someone heard our shrieking came out and shot it after we had taken off. My dad brought me back so I could see it was dead and it smelled like it had been rotting for a week in the sun. I thought he was a jerk for doing that, but I am glad he did because I would have laid awake thinking it was alive and waiting to murder me if he didn't show me it was really dead. I am not scared of bears, moose, getting lost in the woods, or being murdered but I carry a large knife, pepper spray and sometimes a gun because I am terrified of rabies. It was my first big backpacking trip with my Boy Scout troop, just before high school started. We were out in the West, in a territory with all sorts of wildlife, including snakes. 
There were also herds of cows in certain areas and they would leave large piles of poop, about a foot in diameter. One day, near the end of the trip, I had a close call. Part of our crew split up to go mountain biking while the rest stayed at our campsite. I and four other people went to the biking. It wasn't far, but on the way to the place where we would get the bikes, we got caught up in a storm. We had to keep going, however, because we were almost there and would get shelter. When we arrived at the place, we were greeted by staff and they welcomed us inside. Unfortunately, we wouldn't get to go biking, but they made up for it by giving us donuts and orange juice. It was my favorite part of the whole trip. When the storm passed, I went out to go to the bathroom and started running, trying to find a good place to do my business. It was mostly clear and flat. At one point, I looked down and saw that my foot was heading for a green pile of poop from a cow. I jerked my foot out of the way. I passed without a second thought until I realized it looked more like a curled up snake. I looked back, and sure enough I could see its head facing me. It was a rattlesnake. Luckily it was asleep from the storm and it didn't notice my presence. I was still shaken, though and was saved from a rattlesnake bite by a few lucky events. Needless to say, I was more careful of where I was walking after that. I told the rest of my group, and we had a laugh about it afterwards. We even managed to watch it wake up and slither down its hole a few meters away. Few years back I was a marine reservist, my particular job involves being outdoors a lot, especially at night in the middle of nowhere. We never saw anything super spooky but did have some interesting things happen. This particular drill weekend we go up to a lake in North Georgia. We are going to be doing some amphib stuff and a training patrol. This was the first and only time in my six-year contract that we weren't doing this sort of thing on a military installation. We were out on a public lake and going to be patrolling through private properties. Apparently higher-ups had informed local police and residents, but I'm not exactly sure how effective they were in that. Anyway, we load up on the Zodiacs about midnight and ride for about 30 minutes. We slip into the water and fin to our designated spot where cache our swim gear and get our armor vests and other patrolling gear put on. It's about 1 AM on a Friday night. We start patrolling toward our objective and realize we are pretty close to some houses along the edge of the lake. We can't see them, but we can see light coming off of them over the hill, etc. It's early summer, it's been dry, and there are vines everywhere. We are trying to be quiet but we have a dude carrying an M40A5, a guy with a law rocket trainer T-boned across the top of his ruck, there's no moon, and the terrain is treacherous. We are snagging vines everywhere, crunching leaves, making way more noise than we want to. We ended up getting near some people partying on a dock and had a close call that lasted till about 3 AM before they gave up and went home. After that we were patrolling across roads and through backyards, probably a pretty terrifying sight in a quiet neighborhood if anyone saw us. Six man team with rucks and armor and assault rifles and night vision goggles etc. Later that same op, we had just settled into our hide site as the sun was coming up, we're doing all the stuff associated with getting ready to execute our plan for the day. We were about a mile from any house or road at this point, so in a fairly isolated tract of woods. Shortly after sunrise I'm leaned up against my ruck trying to get some sleep while team leader gets all his shit done, and we all hear feet shuffling through the leaves. Everyone freezes, then starts quietly packing shit up in case we have to run. About 50 yards away I see this middle-aged guy come exhaustedly jogging through the trees. He's white, average height, slight gut, balding and sweaty as f. Weird thing about him is he's way out here running through the open woods wearing some dirty khaki slacks, a gray wife beater, and some black dress shoes. He's also filthy with what looks like engine grease, like he's been working on a car. There are no trails anywhere nearby. We sat in our little ditch and watched him run past us, he came within about 20 to 30 feet of us but was totally oblivious. Never saw him after that. Still wonder what the hell he was doing out there and how funny it would have been if he had ran up in the middle of us. 
In all my many hours in the woods all over this country he's probably the most mysterious thing I've encountered. So we had a paddock basher on our farm and my friends and I were driving though our bottom paddock which was filled with guinea grass, which grows about 6 feet tall. It was a dual cab Toyota Ute so my friend was driving, I was passenger and my other friend was sitting on the tray in the back. My friend driving went over a particularly thick clump of grass and stalled it. We both looked up and through the front windscreen at the same time and saw a shadow of a hand, not a hand just the shadow, creep around a clump of grass and push it aside. As it did, the grass started bending as well. So both started freaking out and she was trying to start the ute while the friend on the back was starting to panic and asking what was wrong. We got the ute started a leg at it. We haven't spoken about it since, I think it was a little bit too real. I don't believe in supernatural things so I wouldn't be surprised if it was a trick of the light and wind. But it was focused on just that clump of grass and we both saw the exact same thing. Defiantly the weirdest slash scariest thing I've ever seen. My first camping trip was about 15 years ago with two friends. I woke up in the middle of the night to a loud crunching. I must have made enough noise in the tent, because it stopped. I waited a good half hour before falling back asleep. Probably an hour later I woke up to the same noise and also really having to pee. I sat in the tent until I couldn't hold it any longer. I woke one of my friends up who did nothing more than hand me a flashlight. Scared to death, but not wanting to piss inside the tent I opened the zipper, turned on the flashlight and immediately saw the fattest raccoon I've ever seen. The raccoon had somehow opened the bag my friend had tied up in a tree and he was munching on a bag of 3D Doritos. I didn't even scare him off and he didn't stop eating until my friend I had awakened came out of the tent pissed, because he had only gotten a few handfuls of the Doritos. I'm guessing I'm not the first, first time camper to have their imagination get the best of them. Near my college campus there is a relatively small forestry area that we used for a club to play airsoft rounds and also to learn survival skills, like evasion maneuvers. So in this small frosty area, we called it the sand pits, we have stumbled across, a tent set up with a back page, plastic bag with beer cans and a ziploc baggie with a whitish stain to it. Rolled up tarp. Mattress, dirty and depressing. Various crap that people dump there, like helmets, toys and clothes. The weirdest was like six dead possums, like weirdly killed. Like their jaws were dislocated and the skin just looked loose. Load of skeletons, animal, probably possum, all over this one small patch of the pits. In another section, like 40 minutes drive away from the pits, in like a forest preserve, we would go on an annual camping trip with the club where we would need to build our own camps and all that. So one night, we are all sitting around the campfire bullshitting and I suddenly hear the faintest of voices, like a man and a woman arguing slash having a conversation. But it was obvious that it was no one in our camp. So I make this intense face as I am straining to ignore everyone else and focus on the voices. As I do this I ask a friend if they hear this shit and he agrees and a couple more join in. So we all decide to go looking for whoever is making the noises, don't know why but whatever. We searched around our area for easily 15 minutes and found nothing and I didn't hear anything the rest of the night. At first I thought I heard some interference on my radio from someone else but it was weird regardless. All this takes place in Florida so apply that note to everything above. Not me, but my father. I was living in Georgia at the time, and he had flown in from Connecticut to visit just after my daughter was born. He was leaving from the Jacksonville airport and made it there several hours before his flight departed, so he decided to check out a nearby hiking spot. My apologies, I don't remember the name, it was around noon, in late November. When he arrived there was only one other car in the parking lot. Maybe half a mile down the trail, he sees a man just standing in the middle of the path, 
not moving. He said something along the lines of hey man, are you alright? And without responding, the man slowly turned around. He was holding a shotgun, and had it aimed straight at my dad. Without saying a word, the man slowly lowered the gun and then quickly put it to his own chin and pulled the trigger. He did not survive. We don't know who the man is, was, or why he did what he did. We had just parked to walk about a half mile to a campsite in a national forest. It's a remote dead end and the trail only leads to one campsite near a river, almost nothing around. As we're getting ready to hike our stuff and this guy walks up the trail. As I said, this trail leads to nowhere but woods on both sides for miles. He was about 6 feet 2 with greasy hair and dressed in a white t-shirt and jeans. He was pulling a cart behind him that was just an old bucket on wheels. He didn't look up or acknowledge us and just kept walking past us further into the woods. The tracks from his little cart went back to our campsite and further beyond that. Still not sure what he was doing out there with that bucket. Back in 2011 my so and I were backpacking in Laos and we ended up in that very isolated village called Muang Noi. To get there you need to take a 3 hours bus from Luang Prabang to Nong Kia, then a 1 hour ride up river on a fisherman's boat. There are no roads to reach the village, and once there there's no internet, no mobile network, and electricity is only on a couple of hours in the evenings. It's a beautiful area though, mountainous, with caves to visit, riverside beach, etc. Although not completely off the map, it's a place where few travelers go, and it happened to be off-season when we went so there was no more than 10 to 15 visitors in the whole village at the time we were there. In the evening, everyone returns from their treks, cave crawls and boat rides, and gather in the only bar-slash-hostel of the village, on an elevated wooden terrace, by the river. The night falls and little by little, groups merge and everyone ends up sitting on big pillows, sipping cocktails and talking about life and travels like their old buddies, whereas no one knew each other just few hours before. To this day, this is one of my favorite backpacking memories, and what came soon after made it even more memorable. So there's this Australian woman, Ronnie, who took the same boat as us to get there. She's a bit odd, something's off about her. She tells people how she was diagnosed with a terminal illness but made a miraculous recovery, and now she's traveling everywhere in Asia with the funds that her friends had collected for what was supposed to be her last trip. Then there is this Australian guy, Ken, who arrived one day after us. He is quite the traveler, and quite the talker too. There are also Spanish, American, and French. At one point, someone asks Ken if he is married. He starts joking about it, but then he proceeds to tell the story of how one day, about 20 years ago, his wife, who was from New Zealand, just vanished. She left him, without warning, a note or anything. They got in touch later to arrange the divorce, but Ken said he never saw her again and he never heard anything from her after the divorce. He told the story with humor, but you could tell that this had been a devastating experience for him. At that point Ronnie, with a very calm voice, inquires, was her name Karen? I look at Ken, and I see his face decompose, going from brash and confident to livid. The place falls silent. Yes. He replies. How do you know her name? Do you know her? Ronnie proceeds to explain how when she heard his story, she realized she knew the exact same story but from the wife's perspective. She had met that Karen at one point in her life. She described her physically to Ken and it was an exact match. At this point we were all looking at each other with big eyes, speechless, absolutely stupefied by the scene we were witnessing. So then, comes the mega WTF moment. Ken asks if she knows what Karen has been up to since they met. And Ronnie replies, she's dead. With a dead F serious tone and face. I swear to God, although I had quite a few drinks, I sobered up instantly. No one was speaking, everyone was staring. Ken was absolutely stunned. 
At that point I was half expecting an alien ship to come out of the sky, or that Ronnie would turn into a demon and eat us all alive. She gave some more details about Karen's passing, it was a car accident, but unfortunately I don't remember much else of what happened and what was said after that. Soon after the bar owner was closing and asked everyone to leave, and so we called it a night. What are the odds of something like that happening? A couple years ago I spent two weeks riding a dirt bike around Cambodia. The last major leg of the trip was three days in the Cardama mountain range in the southwest. Before entering the main trails I stopped to have a smoke and check the weather forecast on my phone. Rain, thunder, rain and thunder. I said F it and proceeded to ride into the mountains because I didn't know when is be back again, plus the weather was stupidly hot so I looked forward to the cool down. After riding a few hours in the first bit of rain and crossing some rivers and dealing with some of the hardest trails I've ever come across, the thunder and lightning came. I didn't know how long to the halfway point where there's a small outpost where there's lodging, and I was soaking wet and it was too late to turn back. My adrenaline was full blast from the surreal landscape of driving into and through this massive storm with no signs of life behind or in front of me, and I had an intense rider's high so was probably going a bit too fast sometimes too. I remember even laughing hysterically to myself a bit. Eventually a stilt house appeared in a clearing on the side of the track and it was getting dark out, so I gave a wave to the people taking cover under the house. They motioned to come over so I slowly took the bike over a plank of wood crossing a ditch and rode it under, took off my helmet, have a smile and a polite, thanks. The next couple hours were pretty intense and strange, because I wasn't allowed to talk and this was explained by hand gestures. If I spoke, I had to leave. Boo would I was given a warm bath in a big bucket and got scrubbed down by the alpha lady and her daughter and a good feed. I had some chalk with me and we had a quiet story time over pictograms and stuff. Managed to teach a magic card trick without talking and just hand gestures and the whole family loved it. Time for bed, fall asleep feeling safe on a platform next to my bike and everyone else goes upstairs. I woke up in the middle of the night to some rustling directly next to my head was frozen for a brief second then sat up right away and could see the silhouette shadow of a person next to me. I said hello a few times, feeling an insane tightness in my stomach and wondering what the F was going on. No response, and as I see a sort of arm retract there's a burst of lightning far away and I can see just this goddamn shadow and my heart sinks. I've got no reception this deep in the jungle, I haven't seen anyone else riding, nobody knows where I am. If this shadow wants to slit my throat, that's it. I move my hand into my bag which was next to me slowly to look for my knife and the shadow turns away and slowly walks away from the house straight into the jungle, away from the track. Finally my balls drop a bit and rummage through my bag and find my phone and switch on the light. Bike key still there, wallet, knife, my two packs of smock. One pack of smokes yes. One pack out of my bag and there's a few sprawled out on the wood. So, I figured whoever or whatever the F it was, they just wanted a smoke and probably saw the floodlights on my bike pull in. Who knows? I found it easy somehow to fall asleep though because well. If they did want to just rob me or kill me it would have been too easy. But they didn't, so I felt safe. But the first sensation of a shadow hovering over me. Most afraid I've ever been in my life and had nightmares about it for a couple weeks afterwards. I was hiking with my girlfriend and our dog, a German Shepherd one-year-old pup, in a region on Transylvania. Instead of hiking up the mountain, we followed a trail that we realized was kind of shitty halfway. It went through the woods pretty much, and I was freaked out because I saw a caution bears. Sign, where I'm from there's no bears, let alone brown bears, I even downloaded a shitty bear repellent app that played a random bell sound to signal to any close by bears to get the f away. There were also some foresters around, chopping trees on a small site. Anyway, I took plenty of pictures, nothing happened, 
We turned back next to a waterfall since it was getting dark and head back to our hotel. Our quaint, Romanian, Draculian hotel, pretty old and made by the same architect that built Brand Castle. And that should be the scary part right? Wrong. A couple days later, I was checking the photos I took, all pretty, and uneventful. Except the one I took by the waterfall when we turned back. At the time I just thought it looked pretty cool and snapped a real quick photo because my girlfriend was getting pissed at the shit trail we picked. Next to the waterfall there was a black figure slash object I couldn't identify, so I zoomed in. My blood froze. It's the strangest thing I've ever seen and I can't really explain what it is. It's a bear-like creature, but it looks too small to be a bear and. Malicious. Too malicious. I've tried to match it with the surroundings but it's without a doubt something there, it's not just low resolution zooming. There's something in that photo. There's more, our dog didn't even flinch at the time of the event, until about 2-3 to three minutes later down the road when he turned around and whined slash growled then gathered us up. We waved it off since he himself was hardly freaked anyway. So it either was a stray brown bear cub and we were possibly in the middle of the path between it and its mom which is terrifying enough for something I can't identify. Ever since I saw the photo I have the feeling we were being stalked that day in the woods. Last year my boyfriend and I were traveling around the big island in Hawaii, backpacking, car camping, and whatnot. We made a point to check out the Volcano National Park while we were there. We first arrived at the park pretty late at night, and all of the easy access campgrounds were closed due to nearby lava activity. So we drove a ways into the park heading for what we hoped was an open campground. We arrive and thankfully there's other cars there, so we know people are camping here. We go outside to scout out a campsite with flashlights, following the paved path around the area. It's pretty dark and cold, and a ways in front of us we hear this strange sound. I was already on edge because everything is more intense in the dark, especially new places, so as soon as I heard it I stopped and listened. I thought maybe it could have been a wild pig, we saw one jump onto the road just a little earlier, but the sound seemed way too deep to be a smaller animal like that. The sound grew louder, which didn't help my anxiety at all, and I thought, Maybe it was someone snoring in their tent. Really loudly. And it must have been a rather big person to have that kind of resonance. As it continued on, I came to the conclusion that no one could possible snore like that, and I was at a complete loss for what it could be. But it was definitely something. In this moment, I found the most probable source of this sound was an immensely obese person, sleeping on a leather couch, was tossing and turning in their sleep. The sound eventually died away, and for a while, my boyfriend and I just stood there. Nothing attacked us, or made any sounds of running away or anything. So we moved on, found a campsite, and went to sleep. The next morning was absolutely beautiful, and our campground was very open and friendly, and we had a great time. Never heard the sound again. We found out later that morning that the campground was right next to a fault line which was visible from our tent. So the sound we heard must have been the actual earth moving and groaning around. Back in the day when I was growing up my folks would send me to a Bible camp every summer. One summer while enjoying some fishing I decided to explore the pond for different spots to catch fish. The pond itself had an island and about half was accessible while the other was heavily wooded. I entered the heavily wooded area keeping an eye basically on the ground and not really paying attention to my surroundings. When I did look up, about halfway around the pond, there was a bunch of deer bones hanging from maple saplings. This freaked me out. But what really freaked me out was when I turned around to nope the F out of there there was a little girl in a red dress standing there smiling at me in total silence. Anyways the girl was just following me and we got out of there. Still have no idea who went out there and tied a bunch of deer bones to trees and after that experience I never went back to that camp.
When I was in my 20s I would often go car camping by myself, well, usually I took my cat, Oberon along. I would drive out of town onto back roads in the mountains, find a likely spot and spend a couple of nights and days reading, walking, communing with nature. This was my therapy and a relief from the city and life stress. One day I found a place that seemed perfect. Up off an old logging road, there was a little meadow with a large, round, flat rock. There were trees around, and a small brook. My cat, Oberon was special. I think he was part black lab. He loved traveling with me. I set out a lunch for us. I like nice things. So I set out a placemat, a cloth napkin, a bottle of good beer, cookies, and a perfect sandwich. Oberon went into the trees, and I went after him. He was just nosing around, and it was so beautiful that I walked a bit alongside the creek for a short way. We were out of sight for my lunch. I think I was gone for maybe 15 minutes. When we went back to the rock table our lunch had been eaten. But not like an animal had gotten to it. The beer was opened, my Swiss army knife was opened to the bottle opener and put aside. The sandwich had a crust left with an obvious human bite mark left, the napkin crumpled and laid on the plate, the packet of cookies open along the seam. We left. In a hurry. I could not get out fast enough. Thank goodness I did not unpack anything more than my picnic. Oberon was upset. He put his ears back and was very tense. I wonder who was there, or, maybe I don't. We live in an old cottage on the edge of a tiny village. There is a very long garden which has hilly fields beyond. We have a platform so you can see the view and often have a drink out there and watch the sunset. It's miles from anywhere but there is a public footpath which crosses the field. On New Year's Eve we like to go out at midnight, have a drink and watch the fireworks from the city on the horizon. So, two years ago, as the bells on our radio chime, we see a figure walking across the fields, away from the village, so we shout and wish him a happy new year. No response, so we kinda wonder what somebody is doing out on their own, in the middle of nowhere at that time. Maybe had a strop and left a party? Last year, same thing, except our adult son and his mate are with us. Exact same thing happens. Same figure, it's dark so we can't see face or clothing clearly, I tell them about last year and how weird it is because the footpath leads across five miles of fields, no houses nearby and very odd if it's a party goer to be leaving on the stroke of midnight. I look back up and the guy has vanished. Vanished from an open field. There's no way he could have run to the tree line in that time. Okay, it was dark but four of us saw him there, and then we turned to look and he wasn't. I have no rational explanation for this but we'll have a phone ready to record this New Year's Eve. Where I live there's a big canal surrounded by farms and woodlands one thing I should point out is no one goes near these woods due to the affectionate nickname of Bummer's Woods and other such shady activities that occur there. It's always dark in there and there's never anyone hanging around in them that it you'd be interested in knowing. Anyway one evening as the sun was starting to set I was walking past the woods alone to get to the canal because I'm an idiot, for reference I'm a 5 feet 2 girl whose only advantage is that my weight would make it difficult to lift me up to kidnap me ha ha, but I'm certainly not a fighter, this car was slowly driving behind me on the road slash path to the canal car park which I thought nothing of since it was probably a dog walker. I changed my mind about the route I was taking and turned round at which point this car did exactly the same thing and turned to continue going my direction. At this point, I'm starting to think something a bit weird is going on. It's evening, I'm alone and there's really no one around at this point should anything happen to me. This is when the motorbike appears at first I think I'll be able to ask for help should the guy in the car follow me. Nope. Guy on the motorbike pulls up next to the car and starts doing exactly the same thing every time I turn and walk a different way, and I'm basically trapped at this point, so I can only walk up and down, 
the car or motorbike turns around and starts driving that way. At one point I even went into the trees on the other side of the path in the hope of climbing over the wall that'd take me onto the main road. I couldn't get over due to all the weeds and rubbish, and at this point the car again turns around and starts driving very slowly past me. It must have carried on for a long time every time I looked they were staring straight at me and every time I moved one of them moved too meaning they basically had me surrounded. I decide to basically leg it back the way I came which would take me out onto the main road near the aforementioned farm, and as I turn round to check my surroundings guess who is behind me. Motorbike guy has pulled up at the entrance to the woodland path and is just staring straight at me as if he's contemplating following me. I'm really scared by this so I basically ran into a nearby field because it's full of tall grass and difficult to get into so I figured these guys wouldn't be able to get in slash see me until I was long gone and I eventually got home alright. Not one of my brighter ideas though, I should have just gone to the farm and asked for help since she knows my grandma but I was worried the guys would get to me before I could, I'm a fat shit I don't move that fast. I used to frequently visit Knoxville, Tennessee in the summer with my grandmother, who was from there, and my cousins. The house we stay at is rather large, in Sevierville, right on the edge of the mountains. There's about an acre of cleared land, and beyond that acres and acres of trees on either side, and at the end of this open field behind the house. We're at the end of the field in the tree line, at the bottom of the hill. Our guardians would usually get irritated if they saw us down there, so we mostly hid on the left side of the woods close to the opening, but in the woods enough to where if one of the adults looked out the back window, they couldn't really see us down there. I'm walking around this side of the woods. There's an old well about 100 meters in that we hang out around. My cousin and little brother are close by, but closer to the opening. I'm walking around mostly looking at the ground and minding my own business. My little brother, who is six at the time, I'm probably about 14, the oldest in the group, calls for me so I start to turn around and head back that way. As I'm walking back I look up. About 20 meters away from me, there's a large tree with a branch sticking out. Above the branch there is nothing, but below the branch, and what makes me sick to my stomach, is the bottom half of what resembles a standing person. All I see is black, black legs, black feet. It looked more like a silhouette. If there was a torso, it would have been facing me. I close my eyes and start running back toward the field, my brother calling for me again. I come out of the woods crying, my older cousin, who lives at this house year around, and still lives in TN, stops me and asks what's going on. I tell him let's get the hell out of here and we go back up to the house. When we get close enough to the back porch he asks me what it is I saw. I can't even get words out at this point I am so terrified. I started to talk and just got out legs and he finishes my thoughts for me. He describes to me exactly what I saw. When I was younger probably like 10 or 11, I went camping with my family. I'll just get right into it. It was about 1 or 2 in the morning, and I couldn't really sleep. The tent me and my brother were in was really hot, and very uncomfortable. Anyway, while I was trying to go to bed I heard a very faint whimper. I tried to ignore it because I figured I was just tired. Our campsite was along a road with many other camps nearby. The whimper started to get louder, and then turned into crying. I heard footsteps outside of our tent, and a girl crying her eyes out. Now let me tell you, IT didn't go faint, IT got louder and louder. IT remained in the same spot the entire time. That's so important because, it indicates that she was looking at our tent site, crying. It gets worse, then it turned into a full-on scream for a few seconds, then cuts out. When she started screaming my brother woke up. We both look at each other and just get all the pillows and stuff our head under them. I couldn't sleep at all that night. I'm just glad we left the next morning. I'm from a small, 
highly religious, Christian, town in central Appalachia. I'm not terribly religious, but I had been playing a video game called Oblivion in which demons enter the world through portals and run amok. I can't say I wasn't a little spooked by what happened this night. Basically, I was taking the trash to the end of my driveway, a one quarter mile stretch of gravel in the middle of nowhere, when I noticed I could see my boots pushing through a light snow that was still collecting on the ground. This was unusual because it was 21 in the middle of February and there was no moon. I paused and realized the usual background noise of wind in the pines had been replaced with a low rumble, something like that of a jet engine. I watched the world around me turn from a pale yellow to a dark red, reflected by the recent dusting of snow onto bent, black trees. Sanguine snowflakes hung in the air as I turned my attention northwest to the roaring blaze, obscured by heavy fog and red mountains. I could see for miles in all directions. The sight was so surreal, I can't add enough detail to express to you how unsettling it was. I'm not surprised that the entire town thought the world was ending. It was just a natural gas pipeline explosion, though. My little town made national news. For the sake of humor I'd like to share, my extremely Christian, and secretly gay, childhood friend called everybody he knew, people he was sure would be raptured, mostly my family, who lived on an adjoining farm. Nobody answered. Of course he thought they'd been lead to heaven by none other than Jesus Christ, in the flesh. What had actually happened was they'd done the smart thing and evacuated their homes, they lived closer to the blast. That dummy stayed put, in his basement, waiting for Satan's army to come knock on his door. A few years ago now I was camping in the middle of nowhere with my fellow Boy Scouts. Everything was great and we were having fun, then it turned out a little kid from a different pack had gone missing after running into the woods. Of course everyone in the camp quickly covered every single inch of the woods, however my group encountered something different. We saw the outline of a small child running through the woods in all different directions so of course we followed him thinking it was the missing boy. As cliche as it sounds there was an abandoned cabin that we ended up arriving at. It would have been beautiful had we not been a bunch of scared to death 10 year olds. Well now we hear laughing from inside the cabin, not some evil laugh or something just a laugh of a little boy. Well my pack leader runs in only to find nobody inside. After 20 more minutes of looking we all head back to report what we saw to the father of the missing child. Well the father after hearing no one can find his son decides to go lay down inside his tent. Inside the tent is the missing boy playing with some sticks. I still have absolutely no clue what we were chasing in the woods and it still gives me chill to this day. Camping in Eastern Washington Mountains with friends. Drinking and shooting guns in the middle of nowhere. Place is dead. Dead trees, dead pine needles, rocks and dirt. Barely any birds. Decide to sleep next to the fire that night. Did it a million times before. Wake up for no reason, sit up in my sleeping bag. From the darkness this thing the exact shape and size of a Roomba that moved as fast as a small spider comes straight at the feet of my sleeping bag. The creature stopped without hitting me, I hesitated for a second almost wondering if it actually happened. I jumped my butt back and pulled my feet to me, and the creature moved in an exact line back to where it came from. I sat in the dark for many moments. Did that really just happen? What the F? Before I could gather my mind, it came rushing out from the darkness again, right towards my feet. I was ready this time, jumped out of the sleeping bag and grabbing my shotgun in one motion. The thing scurried back. I chased it into the darkness, and into the woods. Couldn't find anything without a flashlight and the light from the fire was getting small behind me. I returned to the site and slept in the car the rest of the night. Things that struck me, creature never looked to turn in any fashion. Moved like an insect, but was the size of a raccoon? Never touched me? Maybe blind or could sense heat? Moved in completely straight lines. No turning. 
extremely fast. Didn't make any sound at all. I don't spend a lot of time out there, especially after this, but I will always remember that thing. What the F? When I was maybe 14 I think. I'm 22 now. Anyways, at the house I grew up in there were woods all around them and I used to go hiking throughout them and never got scared or freaked out until one day. My usual path through the woods I would take went straight towards a stream and then depending on my mood I would go straight or toward the right. The left was uncharted territory I avoided at all costs and it never seemed strange to me. One day I decided I would force myself to go towards the left and to hell with the strange feelings. So I go left and keep pushing farther and farther until I can't fight the fear building inside me anymore and it just breaks like damn. I'm in full flight mode for no reason and just turn and run full out. As I'm running I hit this fallen log and fall down. When I fall it's like I have this flashback or repressed memory of being even younger and wandering through the woods and falling in the same area except there is a young girl in front of me wearing a bright red raincoat that looked brand new. I'll never forget her face though was just this rotted out and just destroyed. After I remembered that I got up and ran faster than ever back to my house and haven't gone back since. Every now and then I feel her or see her in the corner of my eye but I don't know. I don't think she's violent or angry so I'm not scared about that. She just makes me uneasy sometimes. I grew up really close to the Pacific Crest Trail and when I was about 11, this hiker walked up to our house and claimed he was lost. We lived out in the middle of nowhere so my sister and I were excited to have a new friend to chat up. He indulges us. He's maybe mid-twenties and seems interesting. We let him stay in our house for the night and grab a shower. The next day my dad drives him back to the PCT and we continue our life. He shows up a couple days later saying he decided to give up and make a life here and we were so nice he wanted to tell us. Okay, no problem, spend a night, here's some food, have a nice life. Then he shows up again, bearing a gift, for me. It was a stupid VHS movie, but I never watched it because the very next morning, he catches the bus with me and gives me a letter where he confesses his love and he's sure I'm his soulmate and he'll wait for me to get older and asking if I feel the same way. I was super creeped out and never wanted to talk to him again. I learned a few months later that he actually lived in a trailer park by the bus stop and got really obsessed with me and devised the plan to get closer to me. I didn't even tell my parents until years later. Thankfully, he never made any physical moves on me, but still changed my view of the world at a young age. Shooting guns camping late at night in the Mojave Desert. Had a small old car come driving up to a stop kill its lights. At about 600 yards and slowly crawl towards us and stop every few minutes creeped me the F out so bad I just wanted to leave but I had a canopy and a tent ATV all my shit so I was kinda messed. Who the F comes up to two guys shooting guns in the middle of nowhere. Im thinking great this guy is going to wait till him asleep shoot me and my buddy dead in my tent and rob me had no phone reception really messed. Me and my buddy stayed up all night watching these two guys chain smoke probably at least 200 cigarettes just seeing the glow from a distance until at about 5.30 the sun was rising the car started peeled the F out on this dirt road at about 60 miles per hour hauling ass right past us. Very creepy it was a battered green Toyota Corolla with a donut on its front tire. Me and my buddy packed up our shit so fast we left behind a few camping chairs in the desert which is going to creep someone out lol. But yeah most likely it was a gang members or someone trying to rob us for our stuff. When I was 10, I used to go to a really awesome camp in southern Indiana. Occasionally, they would have trips for people to go on to something like the Red River Gorge, or some caving trips. They had a trip to go to the Foxfire Swamps and you could earn some badges while you were there so I went. 
One of the nights while we were camping, I felt sick. Really sick. I woke up and crawled out of my sleeping bag and hurled next to a tree. Now this is where it gets creepy. We had a campfire going and it would occasionally do a pop, like all campfires do. I started hearing leaves shuffling around like something was moving slowly about 20 or so feet in front of me. I thought it was just an animal so I got back in my sleeping bag and fell asleep. I woke up later and I wasn't under the tarp we set up like a tent. I was 10 feet away from the thing. I was confused and looked around and saw a humanoid figure walking away from the campfire. This figure was too big to be anyone from our group. The campers were 12 at max age and none of the counselors there were that big. At the time, I was obsessed with the idea of cryptids so I thought it was Bigfoot or some shit, but after I grew out of that phase, I realize now that it was definitely a person. When we got back up in the morning, food and wrappers were scattered around the camp, but not like how things like raccoons, possums, and squirrels do it. Nobody said they got up and ate anything that night and I was the only one that was up at all late. We had to leave early because we didn't have enough food for the rest of the trip. So I think someone probably raided our camp at night and for some reason moved me, in my sleeping bag, from under the tarp. I live in a pretty old house, the earliest tax records are about 1880 I think so it's at least that old. It's your typical southern mansion, lots of land surrounded by a hardwood forest. There's a butler's home that we rent out and remnants of a barn that burned down a long time ago. There's always been sketchy stuff, like a 3 by 7 foot concrete tomb like vault underneath the house, a bricked in fireplace, newspaper articles of murders in the early 1900s that we found in the cellar, etc. but nothing that really worries any of us. Sometimes the house creaks at night and we blame it on the wind. Sometimes it sounds like footsteps but we blame those on the black walnuts hitting the roof. Sometimes there's shrill screams in the woods but we blame those on coyotes or mountain lions. About a year ago, I had a really disturbing dream. Everything was black, but not pitch black. It was like being blindfolded. I could hear someone hitting a woman, and she was crying. This went on for a while, and then I heard her choking and kinda gurgling. And then she screamed. It was weak but still angry. She said fine. I'll party. And then I woke up. It was strange but not strange enough to warrant any paranormal suspicion. A couple months ago my stepmom started having night terrors. Like wake up screaming night terrors. They lasted about a week, I think she had about three. They included her seeing a grim reaper and at one point she grabbed the shotgun and my dad had to talk her down from nearly attacking him. Scary stuff. So I finally decided to do some research and see if there was some shady history to this place. And then I found the article. In the 90s, a few young men picked up a hitchhiking woman and carried her to the woods by my house. They brutally tortured and mutilated her, raped her, cut off her fingers, and a whole list of terrible things. Her last words as one of those men stood on her throat? I quote the court case, she gurgled blood and said okay, I'll party, then died. I told my dad and sent him links to the article. We agreed to never speak of it again and not tell my stepmom. Creepy shit man. I would post the articles but I don't want everybody to know where I live. It was a pretty controversial case in my state because one of the bastards was a minor but they wanted to give him the death penalty so if you really wanted to find it, you probably could. Or you could PM me and I'll send you the court case. But holy shit that creeps me the F out. My park patrol had become so sleepy, that I began taking the liberty of spending the earliest part of it, walking one of the shorter trails. It's technically not a bad thing to do, it just meant that I wouldn't be able to speed off to respond to any incidents right away. But I was coming up on week 6 without any kind of alert so I began to relax my approach to things. And yes, Murphy's Law has a way of singling people like me out. I was at the point on the trail that was the furthest from my car. When I had heard a horrible shrieking that shattered the silence of the forest. 
I was torn between sprinting back to my car and just running to where the screaming seemed to be coming from. But when you're surrounded by trees like that, it's pretty impossible to gauge just how far away any sound is. I opted for doing the whole thing on foot. Promising myself that I'd never leave my car behind again. The screaming continued and I seemed to be zeroing in on it. But when I thought I was going to come up on a source, it would suddenly be another 15 seconds of running away. I wondered if I was having hearing issues. Or if the acoustics of the forest were just so unfortunately arranged that that screwed with my perceptions badly. But it kept happening. My urgency began to melt into suspicion. I did the worst thing that any park ranger could do in a situation like that. And I stopped chasing. Instead I began creeping. I crept up through the tall grasses, ducking behind trees trying to get as close to the noise as I could. Before whatever it was could give me the slip again. It worked. Peering out from behind my tree, I saw something that was only vaguely human. From its head to its neck, to its shoulders was a stretched membrane of skin that almost made it look like a nun's headwear except it was skin the whole thing was nude and seemed to be of the female persuasion its chest was flat and long and pendulous the eyes were gaping and yellowed the mouth was something else and it stretched open almost like it was distended unhinged like a snake's jaw and the unnaturally yawning cavity bellowed another plaintive cry of distress. The polarity of everything changed in that very moment. I was being deceived. But deceived into what I didn't know. I put one hand on my pistol just to be safe. And I began to back away from the direction I was heading. The creature or whatever swayed as if anxious. And it let out another longer louder cry. I just kept backing up. This caused the creature to scream again. But not in distress. It was the hell of an enraged predator. Deprived of a meal, it rocketed toward me. Propelling itself through its strides with its knuckles. Like that of a gorilla, in the time that it took me to bring my pistol up to an aiming position. The creature was close enough for me to spit on. Luck was on my side at the last possible second. My shot landed right between the eyes of it and it face planted hard into the ground. Here's the part that might get rejected, from being read. I got ready to radio out and tell the office what I'd just experienced. But the body of the creature slowly crumbled into a pile of white pulsating embers. That cooled off into gray ashes. I poked at the pile for bones or anything. But there was nothing left. I quickly told the main office that there was nothing wrong. And when they questioned me I just told them off. I quickly dismissed anything and told them I didn't feel well. And then, shortly afterwards I quit that job entirely. I'm Cole Michaels, and I live here in Coquitlam, a city in the lower mainland of British Columbia, Canada. I work for the Coquitlam Park Ranger Team a volunteer search and rescue association based in here in British Columbia. Our primary area of operations is just shy of 2,000 square kilometers, and includes some of the most rugged and inaccessible terrain in the southwest region of the province of British Columbia. The team also provides assistance to residents during natural disasters such as floods and earthquakes. But my work isn't at the glamorous end of the spectrum loading up into helicopters and winching wounded walkers off of mountain trails. I'm more at home in my office cubicle than I am in the belly of a rescue chopper, and much more comfortable in jeans and a polo than a climbing harness and safety helmet. You see, for the past few years, myself and a handful of other IT graduates have been working on a publicly accessible database that compiles information of British Columbia's missing persons. We've built a database with dozens of names compiled from the memories of SAR volunteers throughout the province. So far it dates back to 2002, when many files started going electronic. Delving further into the past will be difficult, with paper records gathering dust on the desks of other volunteer members, but it's something we find extremely fulfilling. Every missing person's profile we complete is a little ray of hope for a family that would do anything to gain a little closure, and each one is a personal victory for my small, but dedicated team. 
Having said that, there is one case in particular that I'd like to discuss today, one that left me increasingly disturbed the more I studied it. This is the story of Mackie Basil's disappearance. Immaculate Mackie Basil was born on December 8th, th, 1985. The 8th of December is also the date of the Roman Catholic Feast of the Immaculate Conception, which is how Mackie's parents decided on her name. Although we've been unable to find out why, Mackie's parents, Samuel Basil and Patricia Joseph, abandoned her to British Columbia's foster care system when she was young, along with her sisters Ida and Crystal. She was known to be an introvert who rarely partied and was not known to drink or do drugs. She was also very selective with who she spent time with and often preferred to stay at home cleaning, decorating, completing tasks, being online, talking with her sisters or spending time with her son, Jameson, who was just five years old at the time of her disappearance. The testimonies of those close to her, referencing Mackie's preference to quiet nights in as opposed to drunken nights out, leads us to our first major conundrum. Because on the night she was last seen, Mackie was apparently attending a house party on the Tachi Reserve, an enclave of the TLS-10 tribe of First Nations people, of which Mackie was a member. She was driven up to the reserve by a cousin of hers named Keith, which is again unusual given that Mackie was apparently averse to going anywhere without her own wheels, and if she did, it was often with her son in tow, along with some extra clothes, a makeup bag and a bag of spare diapers for her young son. This, along with the fact that the house party was only 20 minutes walk from her own home, leads us to believe that Mackie had intended to walk home, and for whatever reason, had made the decision to drink alcohol that night. It was also June 13th th of 2013 at the time of the house party, and summer in British Columbia can be much more temperate than people imagine, therefore ruling out the possibility that Mackie was caught in bad weather. The next thing that we know for certain is that the police then named Mackie's cousin and his friend, Victor, as suspects in the disappearance. Both were arrested and subjected to polygraph tests to determine if there were any inconsistencies in their story. At the time, given that they were the last two people to see Mackie alive, it was assumed to be a given that they were responsible for any foul play that may have occurred. But the Royal Canadian Mounted Police reported to the Basil family that both men were cooperative, and that even interviews forensic psychologist had gone very well essentially eliminating Keith and Victor as suspects. However, what became evident during these interviews is that Victor and Keith didn't just give Mackie a ride to the house party on the Tash Reserve, they actually gave her a ride back too. Somehow, Mackie had gotten out of the car during a ride home that should have taken four to five minutes, maybe even less. During interviews, Victor and Keith had claimed that their truck became stuck in a patch of mud, but it was high summer at the time and recent weather had been fair. Obviously, this answer did not satisfy police investigators, hence why they were subjected to numerous interviews and lie detection tests. But afterward, they were happy enough to release the men from custody. Our team has reached out to Victor and Keith, in order to ask them to shed a little more light on the events of that evening. Both aggressively declined. We may never know the reason that Mackie got out of her cousin's truck that evening, but we're certain she did. Forensic examination of her truck she was present and found absolutely no traces of blood, or anything else which may lead us to believe they had killed her. What's clear is that Mackie was now alone, in the middle of the night, on a lonely woodland road in the middle of British Columbia. If the RCMP have effectively ruled out foul play as the reason she disappeared, this leaves us with two serious theories, accident or animal attack. Although there are numerous dangerous wild animals that are known to live in the area around Tachi slash Kush, the theory of an animal attack is brought into question due to the lack of evidence of an attack found by the searchers involved in the thorough ground and air search. There was no confirmed recovery of any of the items that the young mother had when she went missing nor was there any discovery of blood or other remains confirmed to be hers. If she went missing due to an accident or misadventure, then it is also reasonable to presume that she would have walked to where she met her demise. 
This would have been well within the range of the search party who were looking for her remains, which were never found. For all intents and purposes, a young woman went to a house party one night, and then dropped off the face of the earth. Missing people always leave something of a trail behind, one that 99% of the time, leads us to locate them, be it dead or alive. But somehow, Mackie did not, it really is as if she just melted into the ether. It should be also noted that Mackie's cousin, Bonnie Marie Joseph, went missing on the exact same stretch of road, just six years previously in September of 2007. This stretch of road happens to be known as the Highway of Tears, a 725-kilometer corridor of Highway 16 between Prince George and Prince Rupert, British Columbia, which has been the location of many murders and disappearances beginning in 1970. What sets Mackey's disappearance apart is that most of these other murders and disappearances have been solved relatively easily. While Mackey's case shows absolutely no sign of being solved anytime soon, If you are wanting a quiet and laid-back job, don't become a park ranger. Being a park ranger doesn't put you at the back of the world, where you'll be safe and unharmed. No. Being a ranger puts you at the forefront of the line. Marines, National Guard, SEALs. Give me one of those guys for six weeks and I guarantee you they'll be crapping their pants in ways they never did during basic. Look, the job puts you right at the contact point between the edge of humanity and the edge of darkness. As a park ranger, you are the unwitting crosswalk guard because there are always people trying to plunge into the darkness. And there are always things in the darkness trying to break through into the domain of man. Now with that little rant out of the way, here's my personal story. Rumors of wild animal attacks in the park begin to pile up. People would come out of the park with bite marks slash wounds that were made by something from the animal kingdom. But, a few of the victims reported that the assailant was a man. A couple even went on to say that it was a full-on lycanthropy. The delusion held by a person that they are a wolf or a werewolf. I didn't exactly sign on to take down nut jobs. But myself, and my fellow rangers were briefed on what to do if we ever ran into the predator at large and what we would do if it was an animal and what we would do if it was a human being, and thus we were expected to be more alert and vigilant and proactive than we were to begin with. I was out on patrol when I was sure that I saw movement in the trees. It looked unusual. I prayed that it wasn't a predator. I wasn't afraid, I just didn't want to tangle with anything. I readied my service firearm, got out of the car and called out in the direction of the movement. There was a response. I was met with the face of a man with hair so long that he would probably step on it if he wasn't careful. His eyes were wide open. To the point they were perfectly round o's. He tilted his head at me, in a mocking sneer. His teeth were yellow and pink and I'm pretty sure that he was completely naked. So, it was a safe bet that he was a nutcase. But I did mind the protocol and behaved as if he could understand me. I called to him to stand down and stop for a chat. He was waiting for me in a clearing. That beard of his was swaying like brown vines. Hanging from an ancient swamp tree. Madness rang out like an emergency siren from his eyes. There was no way that he was a rational human being. I trained my firearm on him and again attempted to talk him down. And that's when he projectile vomited something foul and bloody onto me. Stunned with disgust, not only was it obvious that he had spewed blood on me, the contents of his stomach was a whole collection of small fingers. Way too tiny to be that of an adult and the sheer number suggested that he had fed on multiple children. I almost felt that he had engorged himself just for the occasion. As a parent and a new grandparent, the situation had just taken a very personal turn. I gave chase and this maniac held long and high. It's not possible to explain just how fast he was. I would be close to catching up as to get a clear shot. And then he was darting ahead, out of range. I began to feel that I was being toyed with. The madness of the whole thing turned just plain evil. When the pursuit took me out, 
onto one of the playgrounds where plenty of kids were present. Like lightning the nude grinning monster had grabbed up a tiny girl by the hair. Scrawny as a newborn deer and sunken his teeth into one of her eyes and bitten it out. When I fired he had already flung her up in the line of fire. And just like that she was a one-eyed human shield. Her body knocked me back as she hit me square in the face. When I was regaining myself, the monster was already launching at yet another child. I was able to react in a fraction of the time. Only thanks to the adrenaline tearing through my system. Skull fragments flew and his outstretched fingers went limp before he could wrap them around a boy's small neck. I don't think I've ever fought so hard to keep consciousness. My body was trying to black out probably to cushion me from the knowledge that I'd just shot a child, the instant after she had been mutilated by a crazed monster. That's when the thought hit me. Was she even dead? I was beginning to see devil. I found her face down in the grass. Her hysterical parents were running to her. Turning her over, looking at her eye socket. This might be the most frightening part of all. Somewhere inside of me came the urge to shoot it. She was ruined. She would be scarred, and it was all because I was half a second too slow. One shot ruined. It was almost like I was hearing the thought out loud. Like it was being put into my brain. But my brain had finally snapped and I blacked out. I'm not too sure the outcome of everything, once I regained consciousness. The police were on all this pretty quickly. I resigned after being blackmailed and I can't give too much details about that. But I know SUVs and men in suits were quick at the scene. It's probably no surprise that none of this made it to the news. Or any news outlets online. And as far as I know, they took that little girl who by the way was still alive into custody on their end. Again, I don't know whatever happened, but I don't work in that job field anymore. Years ago, back when I was living up in the state of Maine for a few years, I loved to go explore the outdoors. In fact, I made it a thing during the spring and summer to go and try and hike as many trails as I could. Most of it was to just motivate me to get in shape and stay in shape. Having dealt with extremely toxic eating habits and a lot of weight gain, I figured the best thing for me was to be out in nature. Hiking, losing weight. After all I hated running, jogging, working out. But I love the woods. And walking almost feels like you're not doing anything. And it's easily one of the best and easiest exercises to pull off. I would usually start walking anywhere between 3 to 5 miles a day. I had no problems with it. I loved it. So in hindsight, it's the reason why I lost so much weight. But on this particular day in July, would stop my progression for at least a month because whatever I saw, scared the living terror out of me. I get there to the trailhead and I'm getting out of my car when I notice I'm the only one in the parking lot. Even though it was a very small parking lot. But still, it was a beautiful day in late July, and the only other vehicle I could see was a ranger's vehicle, who drove up to me quickly as I was getting my own backpack out the back seat. He called me over and wanted to speak to me. Ask what I was doing I told him I was working on endurance walking. Going up the trail. And this one was about a 5 mile loop. Which I told him was perfect. He informed me and his behavior was very disturbing that I should try and find a different trailhead in a different area. And said there's been some possible animal sightings that were unknown and could pose a threat. I looked at him strangely and asked him do you mean like wolves or bears? And I'll never forget him looking away, looking down and just saying no. Not quite. And just kept referring back to that it's probably not the best idea I choose to hike this path. That it could potentially be dangerous. He was acting really weird avoiding specific answers and wouldn't answer my questions. I thought the dude was weird. Afterwards, he ended the conversation, drove off and wished me luck. I was thinking whatever dude. So I walked off and did my thing. I get about 4 miles down the trail, probably about near an hour in. I was a pretty fast walker. Like I said I was probably a little over an hour into my trail when I come around to bend in the small trail. 
and directly ahead of me, coming right out of the trees, were two extremely large brown-shaped humanoid things walking right towards me at a slow pace. My first thought actually. Get this, when I saw these two things. And forgive me because I can't remember their names. But in Star Wars you have these white yeti looking things. The same creature that I believe Luke kills in episode 5. But forgive me if I'm wrong. They reminded me of that, big huge hands humanoid except they were brown. But they kind of had that same walk, slow and menacing. I immediately turned back around and started running as fast as I could. Thinking myself if these are Bigfoot. I'm most certainly dead. I'm not sure if it was my endurance at the time or pure terror taking over me. But I ran the extra 4 miles back to the parking lot. And probably half the time, that it took me up the trail. Also, I contribute that to the fact it was mostly downhill. So maybe 20 to 30 minutes. The things, well I don't know if they ever followed me I never turned around to check. But either way it scared the lights out of me. Did I get a real good look at them? No. I saw enough, to know that it was no bueno. Nine foot tall, hairy wood looking ape beast humanoid things. Scary, scary, scary. I never did go back to that trailhead again after that. And hiked in completely different areas. A few years later I moved out of the state down to Florida. Where I still am today. Still, I've gone through some crazy stuff in my life and nothing at all compares to the terror I felt in that moment and on that day. Now maybe I understand why that park ranger was acting so strange. He must have known something. Why he didn't tell me. I'll never know. My best friend from high school and I both became park rangers. It was something we had always dreamed about the only bummer was that we were park rangers at different parks. One weekend I went over to Yosemite National Park where he worked, for a quick camping weekend and a catch-up session. Although it was a quick three-day camping trip it was something we had been planning for months. We had a few of our old friends with us for the weekend. The first night we basically just made a fire and everybody drank massive amounts of beer. I've never been much of a drinker so when everyone else fell fast asleep I was still wide awake. It was a beautiful night and I wanted to stay up and look at the stars. My best friend stayed up with me for as long as he could but it wasn't long before he was also fast asleep. By that time it was nearly midnight. I was seated on a camping chair enjoying the view. The moon was pretty bright that night so I could see fairly well. Most of it looked like nothing more than shadows of course but I was able to make out shapes and items and I could see fairly far into the night. While I was sitting, I saw the dark figure of what I assumed to be a coyote. It had a very odd walk as if its feet were too heavy for it. I know it sounds silly but it looked like it was dragging its feet or something. It looked pretty large and it crossed between two large bushes a little way in the distance. I made a note of it checking to see if we had left any food out that it might want to get into later. A few minutes later I saw the same coyote crossing in the exact same spot. Again, I figured it was the same animal because of its larger size. And the way it seemed to be dragging his feet. It struck me as odd but I didn't bother too much thinking about it. That is until it happened again. The same dog crossed in exactly the same place. For the third time. I immediately felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up. That was incredibly unusual behavior for an animal like a coyote. I stood up and waited for it to get back. For some reason I figured that if I'm on my feet I'll get a better look at it and maybe understand what's going on. By that point the only reasonable explanation to me was that I was losing my mind. I turned back to see if I could see a cell phone light or anything in one of the tents. I was hoping that perhaps someone was awake and they could come see what I was seeing, then I'd know that I'm not crazy. Instead, when I turned, I spotted the creature walking past two smallish trees behind our campsite. That's when it dawned on me what was really going on. The creature was walking in a large circle. I watched as it circled our campsite for what felt like hours. In reality I think it was only about 15 minutes. I sat down in my seat and decided that I would watch. I didn't know what it was doing, 
but I didn't want to let my guard down. It was very big for a coyote and it was behaving oddly so I didn't trust it one bit. Eventually the creature let out a low growl, deeper than any other coyote I'd ever heard. And sat down. It seemed to be frustrated with the fact that I was still watching it. It sat down and faced me, and we stared at each other. The longer I looked at the creature, the more nauseous I felt. But something in me said that I needed to stay awake and I needed to keep an eye on it. So I did. It wasn't until the sun was getting ready to rise that the dog moved again. I was so excited to see the sky lightning that I glanced away from the creature for only about a second. When I looked back I saw something that made my blood run cold. Exactly where the dog was, stood a tall person. And I watched as he walked away, disappearing into the nearby tree line. I blinked a few times to make sure that what I was seeing was real, it certainly was. By the time I hung over friends all woke up I was fast asleep. I was exhausted and terrified of what I had seen and I planned on staying awake the next night to see if I could see it again. I didn't but I did go look at where the dog was walking and I found hundreds of dog track. And then, seemingly out of nowhere I found human tracks walking back into the trees. The park I work in also has a large camping area. Sometimes, we act more like security trying to keep people from going into the restricted areas of the woods in parkland after dark. These areas are out of bounds for very good and often uninteresting reasons. Sometimes there may be rare birds nests that we don't want disturbed. Or there's been some torrential rain which has made a certain area treacherous. But people sometimes like to think they know better. One important thing about the park I work at, is there are no bears. No bears at all in the entire area. Not been a bear sighting here for decades actually. So when we got a report from a little girl about seeing a really really large black bear we were pretty confused. And also thought the girl must be too. I had a good search in the area anyway. Just to please the child. And was stunned to find that there were very clearly bear claw scratches on trees where the child had reportedly seen the animal. There was no other evidence and we searched thoroughly through the whole park for any other signs but nothing. We still have no idea how it would be even possible for a huge bear to appear out of nowhere. When there hadn't even been a single bear sighting in the entire county for nearly 70 years. And even more how only one small girl could see it. Then it just disappears again. If it happened for the fresh scratches we would have thought that it was a prank, by one of our own animal experts. Even though they were adamant that it was legitimate. We will never know for certain, exactly what happened. And how it was even possible. There was talk about it being a ghost of a bear but that's not something I tend to believe in. However, I really couldn't think of any other possible explanation. I lived in Montana at the time this happened. Near the mountains. I lived in a small cabin with my wife and our two dogs. It was normally very quiet and nothing really happened out there. One night my wife ended up staying late at work to cover for someone who caught out sick. I was at the cabin alone, it wasn't something that was unusual. I've spent plenty of alone time in that cabin before. And it's never been something that's bothered me at all. I was laying in bed getting ready to go to sleep, when the dog started barking. I got up thinking that they must just need to use the bathroom really quick. Both of them were sitting calmly in front of the front door barking. It was kind of like they were waiting for someone to give them treats. I walked over to them to see what they were looking at and when I touched Penny, my Australian Shepherd Rescue, she bit me. She'd never bitten anyone in her life. And I was honestly shocked. By it right after she seemed to snap out of it she came over to come knowing that she had just heard me. It was very bizarre that she had just bitten me. My other dog Roscoe hadn't moved from the spot the entire time. I didn't want to move him, and risk him biting me too. So I shook some treats and he left the spot and went to eat them. I looked out the window and I didn't see anything that would have alerted them like that. It was weird, I brought them into my room and laid down on the bed with them. 
Eventually I ended up falling asleep. The next day I told my wife about what happened. And we kind of assumed that they must have heard something outside. A raccoon, a possum or anything. Later that night I just finished cleaning up after dinner and I went to take the garbage out to the bin. I heard something rattling in the distance. I turned to look at where it was coming from and it sounded like it was coming from our garage. The garage was detached and we used it mostly for storage. But when I went out there the garage door was open for some reason. I walked towards it and tried to peer inside to see if I could see if there was anything in there. I assumed it was a raccoon or something. I heard this strange chattering noise from the garage. I froze in place when I heard it. It didn't sound like anything that I've ever heard before. I stopped walking towards it and just turned back to go inside the house. If it was some rabid raccoon or something, it was probably best just to call an exterminator. I told my wife and we decided that that would be best. I called an exterminator in the morning. And they were able to send someone out that day. I had them take a look in the garage and around the house. They didn't see any signs of wildlife. No raccoons, opossums, stray cats, nothing. I definitely thought that was weird. I know I heard something in that garage. It was all starting to feel very strange. I went back inside and my wife was working the night shift again. And I was expecting to be home alone until 3 AM. I brought the dogs into my room and got ready for bed. I was nearly asleep when I heard the dogs barking again. I opened up my eyes and saw them sitting in front of the window. Just like they were a couple days ago. I jumped up and peeked through it to see what it was that they were barking at. I didn't see anything outside at first there was nothing running around or digging in the trash. But I looked up and then I saw it. In the sky I could see these three red lights circling and dancing around. It was close to the cabin strangely close. Part of me wanted to go outside and investigate it further, but another part of me wanted to run and hide in the closet. I kept my eyes on the lights and they disappeared out of nowhere. When they both vanished, both of the dogs stopped barking. I couldn't sleep that night all I could think about was those lights. I wonder why they were affecting my dogs like that. I told my wife and she thought it must have been some sort of dream. I was starting to believe it for myself and I actually felt a little crazy. But after about a week later the same thing happened. I jumped up as soon as I saw the dogs barking and this time I decided I would have to go see what it was. I ran to the porch and looked up at the sky. The lights danced and coalesced in the air. It was almost hypnotizing to look at. I wanted to run away when I saw them but I was frozen in place. I woke up the next morning in bed but the worst headache I've had in my entire life. I was next to my wife and wearing shorts and a t-shirt. I couldn't remember how I got there. I remembered getting out of bed and going to look outside at these lights. Everything else just went dark. I woke up and told my wife what had happened. And she thought it was just a dream I must have had. My wife didn't believe anything I said about what happened. And she couldn't understand why it was so fixated on it. I just can't shake the feeling that something happened to me, that I can't remember. I feel like I need to find out, but I don't even know where to begin. Every summer, for the past few years, a group of friends and I have traveled from our homes in Liverpool, in the UK, to Dumfries and Galloway, in Scotland. Dumfries and Galloway is home to the largest, continuous forest in the whole of the United Kingdom, Galloway Forest Park. It's about as wild as it gets for the UK, with some parts of the woods being so dense and overgrown that it's clear no one has stepped foot in them for hundreds, possibly thousands of years. Our yearly visits brought us peace, clarity and a respect for nature. But last year's trip ended in one of the most horrifying and distressing incidents of my entire life. One that completely changed the way I see the world, and the way I consider the human mind. Year in, year out, we take an overnight coach up across the border, then hike out to a place called Loch Aber. The Loch is a private fishing lake, supposedly reserved for members of a local fishing club who ensure that the waters are chock full of fish for them to catch, which makes it oh so easy for us to pull a quick, 
In and out raid to catch enough of the smaller rough fish for our dinner. I'm serious, 45 minutes and we're golden, and take it from any fisherman, that is lightning speed for a half decent catch. But, last year, we decided we were tired of the same old digs and set our gazes further afield. A map told us that there was a similarly deep lock about 30 miles east, known as Lock D. We figured it would be a perfect fishing spot, and we were right. Sure it wasn't as quick fire as the private member's lake, but it came with considerably less guilt. Everything was going perfect, that was until the second night, when in the middle of a campfire drinking session, one of my buddies jumped out of his seat and recoiled from the fire. Who the hell is that? He asked, sort of calmly at first, nothing more than cautious confusion. Who's who? Someone replies lazily. Someone moving, through the trees back there he was pointing into the trees directly behind my back. I actually gave a hoot of sarcastic laughter at first, thinking he was just trying to scare us. But the moment it became obvious that he was not messing around, a jolt of fear went through me and I too leapt out of my seat, spun around, and shined by torch into the darkness. You could feel the tension among us rising as we desperately looked around for who we might have been talking about. Torch beams darted across the trees, inspecting every trunk or thicket of bushes, but there was nothing, no sign of the person my friend had seen. Hello? Someone called out, immediately shushed by the rest of us. No one wanted to give away our position, but at the same time, we needed to know if there was anyone out there, watching us. But again, nothing, just silence. I think you've had a bit too much to drink, mate, I remember saying to the guy who supposedly seen a figure walking through the trees. I'm fine. I've barely touched that bells I brought, I swear to god I saw someone just then like who? Someone asked, man, woman, young, old, what? I, I don't know he replied shakily, but, they were big, really big. Only big thing around here is your bloody imagination, mate. Now go and get your head down, it's been a long day. And it had, thanks to the overnight coach. No one really sleeps on the journey up to Scotland. I mean, they close their eyes, put some chill music through their earphones, but they never really sleep. So everyone ends up being pretty wrecked by the end of the first night. The next morning, we felt even worse. The first night after such a long journey is usually one where we sleep like the dead, but not that night. None of us could quite relax not with the possibility of having someone stalking us in the backs of our minds. Thank God we were only planning to fish that day, as we really were not in the mood for anything else, given how bloody exhausted we were. After breakfast, we marched down to the lock with our fishing gear. It's a gorgeous area, a crisp, blue lake ringed by hills. It's not unusual to get some really nice, sunny days up in Scotland too, especially during the summer. But that day, the sky was this horrible, grimy gray, like the sun had barely risen at all. I was tired, half soaked from the drizzle, barely even excited to be fishing for my dinner. I actually hoped for something exciting to happen, and for my sins, my wish came true. Look! One of us shouted, over there, other side of the lock. Jesus Christ can you see that thing? It was the same lad that had seen someone, or something, walking through the trees. Where? We were terrified, one sighting could have been his eyes playing tricks on him, another couldn't possibly be a mistake. There, he said, pointing, just on the other side, it came out of the trees for a moment then disappeared again. Please tell me you saw that. Mate, just calm down, it's probably Zhu. I know what I saw. And we need to get the hell out of these bloody woods, right now, he said, grabbing up his fishing gear in a panic. I remember him rushing off back to camp, one of the lads following him, still trying to calm him down. But it was impossible, he was manic, scared half to death by whatever had briefly emerged from the woods on the other side of the lock. I asked the other boys if they'd seen anything, each shook their head. None have had any idea what he was talking about, but that didn't mean they weren't just as freaked out over his outburst. We were supposed to stay for seven full nights. 
but that second one was our last. We'd managed to talk the lad who was panicking down, convince him to stay a few nights more at the very least. We'd come all this way, and I wasn't about to let one of us just leave because they'd had a wee scare or something. But it didn't end there either. In the middle of the night, the lad that had been seeing something burst out of his tent, waking each of us up before asking can you hear that? There was silence, dead silence. I mean I strained my ears trying to hear what had him so spooked, but I heard nothing, just the rustling of a few sleeping bags as confused blokes sat up awake. He was scratching as his own ears, gritting his teeth, rocking back and forth in the dirt as the sound seemed to completely overwhelm him. That's the exact moment I realized, I think the same moment everyone else picked up on it too, that there was no noise. There was no monster. It was all in his head. He was experiencing a psychotic break, and it was all in his head. Have you ever felt a strong presence from the woods, a feeling like you being watched? Well, the truth is something is watching you from the trees and shadows. Monsters hide in the woods, preying on the innocent and striking quickly. They won't stop, they never will. This my story and I hope it serves as a warning to all about the truth of the woods and how dangerous it truly is, how dangerous they are. Growing up I never had a dad. My father left me and my mom when I was young and I haven't seen him since. Sure I get the occasional birthday or Christmas card with money, but besides that he's almost a stranger to me. After my father left my mother decided to leave the city life behind and we moved when I was 10 to Wisconsin where we bought a small cabin out in the woods. At first I hated living there, the woods always terrified me as a kid. Every time I looked out the window towards the woods, I always got an unsettling feeling, chills would run up my spine and I would start to shake uncontrollably. I always felt something was watching me, the feeling never went away even as I got older. I hated the walk to school I had to make every day, the looming feeling of getting watched grew even stronger as I walked in the woods. I felt so vulnerable looking at the tall trees, the woods I lived by had almost an endless stretch of tall trees in the forest, I felt something was watching me up on the trees. My mom though felt completely different about the woods, she loved them. She loved taking walks outside and just staring at the trees and the forest, taking all of nature in. She was an artist so she loved to just sit outside and paint the trees, many of the portraits in our cabin were of the trees in the forest. I asked her if she ever felt a presence when she was out there, like something watching her. Yes, I feel a strong presence, but it's a comforting one, she said. I feel safe and protected. I never understood why she had such a conforming feeling from the woods while I felt a terrifying one, one that kept wide wake almost every night. On one night when I was about to go to sleep I saw something from the trees. It was far off into the distance, but I could barely make out the silhouette of a figure. It was big, and bulky with long arms and from the angle it looked like it was staring right at me. I froze as I started at it, then I heard my mom walking to my room and when I turned to see her open the door, I looked back to see the figure gone. I tried telling my mom but she never listened. She said I was simply imagining things and that I needed to quit being scared of the woods. The woods protect us from the outside world Michael, they are a shield to all the bad things in the world. I knew what I saw, and I knew whatever it was, wasn't protecting me. On the way to school that morning I felt the presence, stronger than ever. Every time I turned around though, nothing was there. Suddenly I heard a branch snap behind me and I didn't dare turn around. I couldn't move, then I heard another branch snap and I took off running. I could hear fast steps behind me as I was running which made me run faster. I could hear the footsteps gaining on me, when it seemed they were right on me I burst out of the woods, sweating like a pig. The day went by normal, once school was over I asked my friend James if he wanted to walk home with me, James was my best friend and the only person who understood my fear of the woods. He lived close by to me and he also could feel a disturbing presence watching him. He tried telling his parents like I did with mine but they didn't listen either. Dude did that really happen? He asked as I told him about what happened on the walk to school. Yeah man, 
I just don't feel comfortable walking in those woods alone man, I know there's something in there, I said what do you think it is? James asked as we started walking home. I don't know, I think I saw it last night though. It was like really big with huge long arms, it was far away so I couldn't see anything else. He was quiet now, then he said, I think I've seen it too. I saw something last night too, it was a lot like the thing you describe. Then we heard a loud snap behind us and turned around to see a tree branch on the ground snapped in half. Dude something's following us, we need to run, James said. No, don't run. I did that and it chased me, maybe if we keep walking slowly it won't do anything. James, looking terrified at me nodded his head slowly as we started walking. We heard more snaps as we walked, getting louder and closer as we walked. I looked over at James, he looked back at me white as a ghost. After what felt like an hour, I could see the outline of my house in the distance. Our pace quickened as we got closer and closer to my house, the snaps and cracks quickening as well behind us. As soon as we got close enough, we took off in a dead sprint towards my house not looking back. We ran inside and I locked the door once we were inside. Everything okay? I heard my mom say behind me. We looked at each other then I heard James say, yeah Mrs. S, we just raced each other to the house. She looked at me and I nodded quickly. Okay, be careful though with the door, it's old and I don't want it falling off. Okay, sorry mom, I said as James started to run off upstairs. Once upstairs and in my room James said, dude, we can't walk that way to school. I know but what will we tell our parents? They won't believe us, I said. James was silent now, I knew he wouldn't be able to come up with anything. I think as long as we're quiet and walk slow, that thing won't come after us, I said. Yeah, let's hope so, James said in a quivering voice. James went home shortly after that and after I ate dinner I headed upstairs to bed. What is that thing I think as I laid in bed? A person? An animal? It's fast like an animal, but it looks like a tall person. I looked out the window into the dark forest, and froze. The thing was there and closer, I could make out more characteristics as I stared at it. It had a hunchback and long fingers with razor sharp claws, I didn't see any eyes on it but I could somehow feel its cold stare locked on me. It just stared, observing me. Then, it turned around and walked back into the forest. That is no person or animal I think to myself once it's gone. It wants me, I'm its prey. After a restless night of sleep, I woke up and walked downstairs to see my mom sitting on the counter with a worried look on her face. Hey mom, everything okay? I asked. Morning honey, I have some bad news, she said look at me. What is it? I asked. Your friend James, well, he's missing. His parents went into his room this morning and he was gone. I stood there petrified, it wasn't following us, it was tracking us. Tracking James. Are you okay Michael? She asked. I could only see James' face in my mind now, the image of him looking at me as we were walking home white as a ghost. I couldn't keep everything in and I told my mom everything, the thing that chased me, me and James being stalked by it, and seeing it for the past two nights getting closer to me. You've got to believe me mom, I pleaded. Something is in those woods and it took James and now I think it's gonna take me. She looked at me with a sad expression, she sighed then said, I know this must be hard for you Michael, but there's nothing in those woods, James might have ran away or anything could have happened. Mom, it took him, James would never run away from his parents, I said. She looked at me then look at the clock behind me, I think it's time you get to school now dear, we'll talk about this later. I pleaded with my mom to drive me to school, begged her on my knees. She finally relented after a minute. Okay, okay just this one time. We need to leave now though and be quick. I have to get to the studio. I thanked her and ran to get my backpack and stuff, nothing happened on the drive as I expected. After dropping me off at the front of the school, everyone ran up to me and asked if I heard about what happened to James. Everyone was talking about James that day, 
they started rumors either saying he ran away or was kidnapped. Do you know what happened to him? Sally asked frantically as she ran up to me at lunch. She had had a crush on James since the second grade and even though James showed no signs of affection towards her, she still adored him. She was a short girl, with short brown hair and brown eyes. I debated about whether I should tell Sally the truth, but I knew she wouldn't believe me, no one would. I told her I didn't know and tried to continue eating my lunch but she wouldn't give up, come on Michael you're his best friend, please if you know anything that could have happened to him please tell me she said with tears in her eyes. I tried ignoring her but she wouldn't stop, then her friends came over and started asking, then more and more people came asking if I knew what happened to James. The voices became too much for me and I screamed, I don't know what happened to him, please leave me alone. I screamed as loud as I could. Everyone stopped talking and now stared at me, my cheeks started to turn red as I got embarrassed. The bell rang and everyone started heading off to class, leaving me still sitting at the lunch table. I packed my unfinished lunch and started to head off to my science class which I had next. I decided then and there that I would find James, I had to know if he was alive or not. James, if you're still alive, I'll find you. After school I called my mom and asked if she could pick me up, she said she could and five minutes later she pulled up in her white Cadillac. As we drove home she asked, feeling better honey? I lied saying, much better. I knew she would never believe me, I was going to have to face that thing on my own. We got home and I headed straight upstairs where I dumped all my school supplies on my bed and started to pack gear for that night. I packed spare flashlight batteries, some water, and I put the pepper spray my mom gave to me last year in my pocket just in case. As I was eating dinner, I came up with a plan. I would sneak out of the house when my mom went to bed which was usually around 10 and I would head into the woods and try to find a look for James. I knew my chances against that thing were slim to none so I knew I would have to be quiet and careful. After dinner I went to my room and waited. I waited for hours until I looked over at my clock which read 10.30 pm. I hopped out of bed and walked over to the window, opening it quietly. I made a little rope with my bed sheets as I waited as I knew I wouldn't be able to jump off the window without getting hurt. I tied the rope against my bed and started to climb out of the house slowly. Once down, I turned my flashlight on and aimed it towards the woods. It was even more terrifying now, the trees seemed endless and I couldn't even see the moon. I took a deep breath, and started to walk slowly into the woods. I noticed something that started to scare me quickly once I was walking, there was absolute silence. Not a peep, no crickets, no owls, nothing. I flashed my light around quickly, calling out James' name quietly. James, James are you out there? Nothing but silence echoes the woods. I walked towards the directions of James' house, thinking he may be around there. As I'm about halfway to his house. The battery for my flashlight dies. Darkness now engulfs me as I panic. I scramble for the batteries in my backpack. Once I find them I take the dead batteries out of my flashlight and put the new ones in. When I turned my light back on, I screamed. Standing in front of me, was that thing. The fear I felt was indescribable, even to this day the image of it still fills my dreams with nightmares. It had no skin. It was all red muscles and tissues. It had no eyes and its mouth was full of dozens of razor sharp teeth as it smiled and drooled looking down at me. It was at least 9 feet tall and it had a bad hunch to its back. Its claws were even sharper close up, as sharp as its teeth were. Its upper body was big and bulky while its long legs were skinny as a twig. Its arms were huge with big muscles and bulging veins. I screamed even more as it bent down and picked me up by the head. It dragged me across the woods as I kicked and screamed, stupid, stupid stupid stupid. What the hell were you thinking coming into the woods I thought. It dragged me until I eventually passed out. When I woke I found myself in a dark cave, hanging upside down by at least 5 feet. The cave looked ancient, with 3 tunnels that led into darkness. I had never seen this cave in the woods, never even knew there was one in the first place. 
The light that was in the cave was from a single fire in the middle of the cave. I could see my backpack on the ground with my phone near it. I tried to reach and grab it, but I couldn't move. The thing had wrapped ropes around my angles to the sharp rocks above me. I was hopeless. I thought to James now as I started to look around the cave. In one of the corners of the caves, I saw a single orange t-shirt on the ground. That's James's shirt, I realized. Suddenly I heard heavy footsteps walking towards me. I saw the thing walk into the cave as it stared at me. I panicked and started screaming again. Then the thing spoke in a dark and gruff voice, "Quiet food. Maybe I'll let you live a little longer." I shut up now, petrified as it spoke to me. I saw in its hand a leg. "Oh god, please let that not be James the first thought." It spoke again now. "I've been watching you for a long time." You have always looked the most appetizing of everyone. It lifted up the leg in its hand then said, "Your friend here tasted wonderful, but I think you'll taste even better." It said with a twisted grin on its face. I started to cry, weeping at the loss of my friend and knowing that I would follow in his footsteps. Somehow, I got out a question in a shaky voice, "What are you?" The thing looked it down at me for a moment, thinking then said, "I am an ancient being." My kind is almost extinct as there are only a few of us left. We have ruled the woods for the past centuries, preying on anything that steps foot on any of our lands. Over time, hunters have come and killed most of my kind. Now we hide in the shadows, only coming out when food is near. I think for a moment before asking another question, do you only eat young kids? The thing now smiled, showing off its dozen of teeth as it said, "Of course, Kids taste the best, very juicy and sweet. It had cut me off the ropes with its claws, squeezing me with its ginormous hands as it started to open its mouth. I was barely able to ask one more question: How can you hunt without any eyes? It stared at me, closing its mouth before saying, "I can track your scent. My nose serves as my eyes, as I have none. I smell my food out before I come for it at night." Lucky for me I didn't have to come for you. You came to me. It opened its mouth wide as I panicked starting to throw myself around trying to get out of its grasp. Hold still food. It boomed at me. I was somehow able to move my hands into my pocket where miraculously I felt the pepper spray that didn't fall out of my pocket. I acted quickly as I got closer to the thing's mouth and pulled out the pepper spray and sprayed it into its face. It shrieked as it dropped me. crying and holding its face. I got up quickly and ran towards the middle entrance where the creature came from. I ran as fast as I could, hearing the creature give chase behind me. I ran until I somehow found the entrance to the cave. I saw light illuminating from the entrance as I ran with all my might into the day. I kept running even after I was out of the cave. I ran and never looked back. I was able to somehow navigate my way through the forest to the cabin. I gave a sigh of relief once I saw the cabin and stopped running. I looked behind me now, expecting the thing to be right behind me, ready to strike. Nothing was there. I walked back to the cabin, out of breath. When I opened the door, my mom ran towards me, embracing me as she cried. "Where have you been?" I called the police and they couldn't find you. I thought I lost you. I didn't say anything. I was tired and hungry. But worse of all I was terrified knowing that more of those things were out there waiting for me. We moved shortly after that to Chicago and moved in with my aunt. I grew up normally and made new friends in Chicago, even got a new best friend named Kyle. I never forgot about James though. He was my first best friend who had my back and died in the hands of a monster. The thought of that thing still haunts me now. I tried telling my mom what happened many times but I couldn't. I knew she still wouldn't believe me. What scares me the most is knowing there are still more of those things out there, hunting in the shadows. I write this story to tell everyone, to warn everyone about these things. They hunt for children, feasting on them. Be careful near the woods. You never know what lurks in the shadows of the trees. Please, don't ever go into the woods at night. They are watching and waiting for you. I am a detective for a sheriff's office in Tennessee. One night, I was called to the scene of a death. 
The victim had died of a gunshot wound to the head. Once there I located the victim laying the floor of an unfinished basement. The victim's spouse was an employee of our sheriff's office, so I ended up asking for the State Bureau of Investigation to work the investigation, to eliminate any kind of conflict of interest. I was told that their response was going to be over four hours due to them working a homicide across the state and it would take a few hours to close up what they were doing and travel to my location. Another detective and myself agreed to wait at the crime scene till they arrived. Since I was already on scene, I agreed to take the first two hours to provide scene security. I sent our deputies back in service to handle calls, leaving me at the scene by myself. I began my watch by sitting in a chair next to an exit door in the basement, leaving the body in eyesight approximately 50 feet away. After 45 minutes, I was surfing the web on my phone when I heard a loud hissing sound followed by what sounded like an open hand smack to a flat surface. The sounds came from where the victim was lying. The house had been cleared and locked down prior to me sending deputies back in service. The only way in or out was the door at which I was sitting. After this, I went outside and pulled my car up to the door and sat there with the engine running. I mentioned the occurrence to the medical examiner and she laughed saying that she hears all kinds of weird noises coming from bodies. I'm pretty sure the hissing sound was gas escaping the body but the loud smack I cannot explain. When I first joined the police, during our first two days of training school we had a lecture from this old sweat. British police slang for an officer who has been in the force for a long time, who'd been in the job for about 20 years. He told us of his weirdest experience of policing. He said he'd been out on patrol in a car, when they got an abandoned call to a house. He got there and it was a big house sort of isolated, and they knocked on the door and no one answered. He went to open the door and it was unlocked, and he walked in. The house was empty. No people, no furniture, no possessions. Completely vacant. He looked around and found no one there, but then looked upstairs and thought he saw someone move. He went upstairs. It was a really big house with a long hall upstairs. When he got up there he saw someone go into the bedroom right at the end of the hall. He followed the person there calling out as he went. Again, all the other rooms were completely empty of even furniture. When he got to the room he saw the person go in, he found it completely empty. No one was in it, and nothing was there apart from a big long mirror. He walked into the room and looked into the mirror. He told us he saw something in the mirror that he said has haunted him for the rest of his life. He wouldn't tell us what he saw, and said he'd tell no one ever, but that it terrified him. He turned around and left the room to leave. As he walked down the hallway he saw that all the rooms were now filled with furniture. No one was there still, but the house no longer looked abandoned. He said he left the house that day never knowing what had happened, or who had called police, but absolutely 100% sure of what he'd seen. He was completely serious and it was obvious that he really believed that was what he'd seen, and it gave me chills down my spine when he was telling us. I've never forgotten it. As a cop I have seen it all. Drunk drivers, meth heads, speeding tickets even a few dead bodies that were clearly the work of some sick and twisted killers. But nothing could prepare me for what I saw that day. This was the night I saw something that couldn't be real. But with my own two eyes. Yes. I saw it with my own eyes and I know what I saw. Nobody will be able to ever convince me otherwise. I'm just glad our small town is sparsely populated. So very little happens here at all. Now I haven't always lived here, I used to be a cop over at a much bigger city where I dealt with much more heinous crimes. Like murders and disturbing things the general public would never want to deal with. And on this night, we would get quite the shock when a woman by the name of Mary Hawkins, her name completely changed for the sake of the story called out to us at about 2 a.m. Reporting an incident outside her house. She's a young attractive woman in her early 40s and is known around town since she's lived here for decades. 
She said something was happening at the back of her property, near the tree line. I'm the officer who personally responded to the call and checked it out. There was nothing there that I could see, so I drove straight to her house after that. Thinking perhaps something had been messing with her. I figured an animal or something. When I arrived though at her door, she looked shaken up. But instead insisting that she saw something very weird outside. She went on to describe a tall bipedal entity covered completely in thick brown hair. Except for its face which was nearly bare with pale white skin. She described it as having no really ears or nose, only slits where its nose should have been. And large pointed ears on top of its head. She said it had red glowing eyes and a mouth full of fangs that looked like they belonged in a Halloween horror prop store. She was terrified. And my presence didn't do much to calm her down either. Now Mary Hawkins had been known in our community for a while. She taught the local preschool, was very involved in the local Baptist church, and spent a lot of her free time helping out with the community. Like homeless shelters and feeding. This is not a woman that would fabricate this kind of call nor would she try and waste an officer's time by calling them out here. And putting on the best performance an actress could do. It just made no sense. This was a genuine honest woman. Why would she make something up like this? I could tell by the way she was acting. This was genuine fear. She was spooked, and she had clearly saw something that was completely out of the ordinary. The image of her face just would not leave my head all night long. It almost looked like she was in physical pain, speaking out about what she experienced. But at least she seemed relieved at seeing our car in the driveway, and knowing we would do our best to keep an eye out for her. I actually didn't end up going back to Hawkins until around noon that very next day, which was strange to me. Since I'm usually eager to get rid of cases as quickly as possible. But something about her case felt different that I had to go back and check up on her. Now so many thoughts were racing through my head on the way there. How could something like this happen? Was this simply just an animal misidentification? I don't know. So I arrived and rang the doorbell. Patiently awaiting for Mrs. Hawkins to answer. She answered. She's tried to smile and you can tell she was still shaken up about last night. Maybe she thought we'd found new evidence or perhaps found the creature in question. But we did not have what it took to solve this mystery. At least not yet. We walked together out to the backside of her property again where she originally spotted this thing. And once more explained to her, we couldn't find anything. But then, we both heard it. This scream that echoed throughout the entirety of the property. It was so loud and shrill. We both froze and I heard it. And Miss Hawkins fell to the ground sobbing. That's when I looked over for the first time and saw the creature Miss Hawkins had described. What I was looking at, was a werewolf-like creature. Probably about eight or nine feet tall, long shiny black hair all over its body and the only parts completely visible were its hands and face. The creature's hands were very similar to a human's. They were larger, had coarse black fur sticking up from the back of its hands. And its face looked like a wolf's except, unlike what she described to me, this thing actually had a very large snout. And no slits for noses. But as it got closer it was salivating, revealing sharp white teeth. This thing was slow at first, almost acting cautiously. We knew in that moment we were in danger. I told her come on, we gotta go. And we headed back to the house where this creature was heading for in our direction. I fired a few rounds at it to deter it, but it didn't help much. At that point it felt like time had slowed down a bit. And I remember just being able to think, ever so clearly. This wasn't going to be a normal day and if this thing got inside this woman's house it would mean the end. I took him again as it ran back into the woods. Just as I was about to fire off another round and this creature disappeared. It was like watching the predator that just sort of dissipated. And Mrs. Hawkins of course was now completely traumatized, more so than last night after seeing this thing again. As for me, I'm not really supposed to be talking about this. But I feel like with your channel it's a line of communication that should be open. We as protectors of the public need to make this stuff known.
I'll end the email for now but know that these things are very, very real. I was an intern for my city's SUV unit. Because I didn't have my own car my dad would drop me off on his way to work and so I was normally in the building before the detectives arrived. One morning I wasn't the first one there. The detective that had been assigned first call was there. So I was starting up the coffee when I heard screaming and banging from the interview room. I peeked through the one-way window and I saw a middle-aged guy smashing the chair against the wall while screaming. I went and told the detective what the guy was doing and he told me the guy had been doing that on and off since he had been brought in. The detective told me the guy had no criminal record and no history of mental health problems but early that morning the guy had broken into his sister's home, stabbed her, choked her, raped her, tied a rope around her neck and then threw her out a window. The guy wouldn't talk he just kept screaming and breaking things. He wasn't even a suspect until his sister regained consciousness and identified him. Last I heard she was alive but is paralyzed from the neck down. He took the easy way out if you know what I mean in jail. No one knew why he did it. Got a call out to a funeral home for a business alarm and found the front door cracked open. My partner and I went inside started checking rooms, and eventually made our way to the basement where they do the embalming. I'm not one to get rattled and don't believe in ghosts, but my partner and I started catching some really weird vibes as soon as we went down the stairs. After an expedited check downstairs, we went back to the main floor and were wrapping up checking the last few rooms. Suddenly, we both heard two distinct footsteps on the floor of the room above us. Game on! Mr. Burglar. We quietly made our way to the stairs leading to the second floor and started up them when I came across a window. The window looked over the room we had just been in, so the steps actually had to have been on the roof itself. The problem with that was that section of the roof had no other ways of entry or egress other than the window I was looking through and it had been painted shut years prior. The weird vibes ramped up so my partner and I looked at each other, agreed that we had done enough room clearing, and noped right out of the building. Being a police officer is not easy. Those of you who are police officers will know that some of the most challenging things we face, is when we need to deal with someone that isn't quite human. Granted, a lot of police officers say that things like that don't exist. I think that they just haven't been doing it long enough. My favorite encounter was something not quite human, was just a couple years ago. I was going through a bit of a rough patch, my wife had lost her job and we were struggling to make ends meet. It's tough to pay for a family on a single police officer's pay. That year we had received many reports of people messing about in the cemetery and vandalizing the headstones. I had agreed to do a walkthrough of the graveyard at the start and end of every shift. It wasn't my favorite thing to do, but I hated the idea of someone being that disrespectful to the dead. Besides my grandparents and great-grandparents are buried there so it felt a little personal. I hadn't physically caught anyone but I did one night catch a glimpse of some teens with spray cans as they ran from the cemetery. But then, one day it just stopped. For no reason. I was always curious as to why but I was paranoid that they might come back. So I kept doing my walkthroughs at the start and end of every shift. Then one night I learned why the kids had never come back. And I don't blame them. If what I saw is what they encountered there, then I'd be surprised if any of them ever have a decent night's sleep again. That particular night it was cold and raining. So I decided not to physically walk but I stopped every couple of yards and pulled out my binoculars to scan the area for naughty teenagers. I checked every inch and then drove a bit further and did it again. At first it felt odd to be looking at the cemetery through binoculars. It always felt like I was spying on the dead. But, I wanted to make sure the area was all clear. I was about to leave when I figured I would do just another quick scan of the area. At first, I thought it was an antelope of some kind. Where we live it isn't uncommon for that to happen. 
But then I noticed that the animal didn't have any ears. For the first few seconds it was just standing still. Then it started moving. When it walked I saw it didn't move like an antelope at all. Instead it had a creeping movement, like an animal that was stalking its prey. It wasn't until it passed below a nearby street lamp that I saw it a bit better. Although it was only briefly in the light I was able to see that it had large paws and large eyes. It was a pale gray color with dirt marks all over it. Honestly it looked like something that was never out in the sunlight. It also dipped its head as it moved below the light, as if it didn't like the light at all. I lost it in the darkness for a moment and then found it again. It seemed to be going from grave to grave, sniffing the dirt as if it was looking for something. Steam rose off the animal's back as it walked in the rain. It was as if its body temperature was crazy hot. As it moved it made a low-pitched grunting sound. It was moving away from me and I could see that it had no tail. And not like dogs who have had their tails removed as puppies, it looked as if it had never had a tail before. Something about the animal made me feel incredibly uncomfortable. Still, I wanted to get a better look. So I decided to move a little closer with my car. The creature perked up as if it heard the sound of my car and bolted off running in the other direction. I sped up hoping to catch another glimpse of it, but it only ran further into the cemetery. The last bit that I saw was as the animal made a run for it up a nearby tree. I've never seen anything run up a tree that fast. It really took me by surprise. I reported what I saw and headed home, calling it quits on my cemetery patrols. Some of my colleagues believe me, some think I made it up one thing is sure though. I've never been back to the cemetery. Not even to visit the graves of my loved ones, and I don't intend to ever go back either. Whatever it was it scared the hell out of me. I used to be a 911 operator for a county's name I will not mention. I've personally received all sorts of very disturbing calls. But this one I'm about to share is one of the few that really stick out to me. I can't remember the exact date or time of the day it happened, but I remember some of the details as they have been forever burned into my memory. The original call came from a female, whom was frantic. Scared for her life. She refused to tell me where she lived. But I was able to narrow it down by the way she described her surroundings and some landmarks that were within eye shot of her location. It took roughly five minutes for the cops to get there. By then, this frantic woman had already locked herself into her house. Equipped with a baseball bat in hand ready to defend herself, against whatever was trying to break in. The officer slowly approached the front door of the trailer involved. Shining his flashlight into it as he cautiously approached. He could tell something large was on the other side of the trailer. Thrashing around. Trying to break into it. Ripping and tearing in its walls and windows. He called out to this thing, asked what it wanted. He just assumed it was some methed out drug addict. But the only reply he got was a loud deep growl. Instantly telling the officer, this was no human. The officer proceeded to unload his gun into the sky. To hopefully scare off this large bear or so what he thought was a bear. And he thought it worked. Because whatever was making all this noise fled into the woods. Although by fleeing he could hear how loud it was and that it was ultimately on two legs and not four. The citizen who called 911 had never heard of Bigfoot before and was not any way aware of what she might have seen that night. She claims it was one of the most terrifying things she had ever witnessed in her life. And that's why she called for help immediately after. And this thing had fled. After speaking with this woman on scene, this officer decided to do some research about what she saw and knew it wasn't anything like what we've seen on TV or read in the books about Bigfoot, or what is depicted as Bigfoot, and also known as Sasquatch. So I myself have also done extensive research on these same types of creatures. They're very real. I've done enough to tell you that it is very unlikely for this thing to be some sort of bear or anything like that. And this lady had seen something else entirely. And if she ever sees it again, she'll recognize it immediately. 
especially if they're trying to break into her house. I've also contacted the local wildlife authorities who were aware of these types of creatures existed. Although, more in rural areas. More specifically around farms where livestock are also present. They told me that Bigfoot sightings are actually quite common, especially in this part of the country. But they typically don't go after people. Unless they feel threatened or so they tell me. So why would one act out against a human like this, and try to break into a trailer? Well, from what I've gathered from talking with this alleged eyewitness, it was maybe acting out of curiosity. But I'm not too sure, and before writing this up of course I've spent several hours speaking to the officer who had arrived on the scene in question. He spent a lot of time reiterating to me just how serious the situation was. And how when he realized, this wasn't a bear or some large animal and that it was actually something on two legs. He knew he was scared and he was in for something that shouldn't be there. I was a few months off of field training when I received a call for a suspicious incident in southwest zone of our jurisdiction. Dispatch advised the caller saw a single light in the sky. I was a few blocks north of the location of the call when it came out, and heard what sounded like an electrical transformer blow just a few minutes before the call came out. I just assumed the caller had seen the flash that typically accompanies these little explosions. While I was en route, dispatch further advised that the subject had made statements indicating the light was, what dispatch referred to as, of the biblical variety as it had made him feel warm. Great. For those that are not familiar, there is a very involved relationship between mentally ill and law enforcement. It seems that the number of mentally ill interactions for law enforcement has drastically increased and doesn't seem to be going anywhere, anytime soon, I'm looking at you crisis intervention training. I request any prior interactions we have with the subject, and dispatch relates what you'd imagine. Numerous calls for people in his house when no indication of such was located, angels in his bedroom, civil disturbances for talking to himself on the train platform. Pretty much the standard offering of someone suffering from a mental illness. Also an officer safety alert. Terrific. Stupid transformer. I arrive on scene and find a man standing in the snow on the sidewalk with a good brown winter jacket, soiled blue jeans and a pair of white New Balance shoes. I remember the shoes were just immaculately white, with heavy wear on the outside edges. The subject, we'll call him Tim has the most peaceful expression on his face with his hands clasped in front of him in what I'd call the communion hold. If you've ever received communion and cup your hands to receive your Jesus wafer, it was like that. Tim waves to me as I park. I walk up and introduce myself, hey sir, I'm Officer Poetic Trigger Pull, how you feeling today? Tim cuts in with a impossibly long run on sentence. The gist of which was him asking if I had seen the light and accepted God's angel into my life. Sorry Tim, must have missed that one. I already know what happened and I don't want to spend any longer than I have to, because psych committal paperwork sucks. So I launch into a perfectly reasonable explanation of how a transformer blew in the area and the light he saw was the explosion. Blah blah. The whole time I'm talking, Tim is smiling and shaking his head at me. That's when he tells me, it was not a flash of light, but a large circle of light that made no noise. It floated above him rather angelically for what Tim perceived was hours and cast a light on him that warmed his skin aka God's touch that expelled his demons. As the large circle of light moved away, Tim told me that the electrical box exploded as the light passed over it. This is where I tell you, I have a morbid fear of UFOs. Legit. I hate even talking about them. At this point, I am quick to disprove Tim, as I don't want to even entertain the notion. I cut Tim off and ask for his ID. He hands it over and I find out he lives just a couple houses down. I am quick to try and convince Tim to return home as I'm sure it was nothing. I begin inquiring about his meds, illicit drug use, alcohol. The works. It all checks out, Tim is kind of just a standard crazy dude. Cool. Time to go. Tim shows me his watch. 
It's a Casio with a Velcro band and the face of which is on Tim's inner wrist. Where the numbers would normally be there are these little zero S. They are the little weird digital zeros that you get on a calculator, where they narrow at the ends and have little spaces between them. If you've ever spelled 80085 with a calculator you'll know what I mean. There are some other dashes on the screen. No biggie. Tim has probably been wearing that watch for 30 years and it's been broken for 29 of them. I start to ask Tim if I can accompany him back to his home when I notice something that still gives me goosebumps even now as I type this. Tim and I are standing in a large circle of slightly melted snow. I have a pain catch in my chest and what could possibly be my first ever panic attack. Internally of course. No one likes to see a cop hyperventilate and shit himself. I look closely at the circle and seen a razor fine edge. The interior of the circle looks like melted snow and is kind of subset below the outer edge. It looks like someone turned a burner on underneath the snow and it was melting from the bottom down. Additionally, I see Tim's footprints walking into the circle from down the sidewalk in the direction of his house. The footprints outside of the circle are fresh and have these nice sharp edges. The ones inside are rounded and look like they have spent a day or two in the sun. My prints inside the circle are fresh as well. At this point in time, my cover officer arrives. One is usually dispatched whenever we have officer safety alerts on a subject. It's my former FTO. Good, me and him are close and I can panic a little in front of him. I pull him by my car and explain everything. He tells me he heard the transformer pop and believes the circle is due to gas, or a sewer. Essentially something terrestrial. He's calm about it and I want to believe him. He takes over and walks Tim back to his house after he makes sure no medical treatment is needed. We're done here. I get back in my car and try to clear myself from the call on my laptop, but the MDT is completely frozen. Not unusual, just annoying. I mic up and tell dispatch I'm 10 to 8. I'm asked to repeat as I'm all static. I drive down the road a bit and it goes through. Not unusual. Our radios suck. I take my phone out to call my former FTO and tell him just how far down the rabbit hole I went with that before he got there. My phone is locked up on the keypad screen. I have to pull the battery to reset it. This is a little unusual, that's never happened before. After a reset, I call my FTO and he essentially tells me to think horses when I hear hoof beats, not zebras. I feel like an idiot and don't tell anyone because as a probationary officer, I can be let go rather easily, and UFOs aren't covered in department policy. I don't drive down that street for a couple months and really really try to forget it. I get a call for a burglar alarm at a house at the cul-de-sac at the end of that same street. The homeowner tells me he only had the alarm trigger once before. I ask when and he tells me when he saw a large light glide over his house a few months back. F me. I don't go down that street alone on midnights. Ever. This was just one of three incidents I've had at work. The other two were lights over Lake Michigan shoreline. My mom worked as a nurse practitioner at Denver County Jail back when I was in middle school. I remember one day where she came home early because she was pretty shaken up. She had gone into work and started her beginning of shift duties, which included looking over the charts of any inmates currently in the ward. She passed one of the easy way out watch cells, basically a concrete box with a bench and a drain on the floor, and noticed that there was a man inside. He was in prison garb but my mom didn't recognize him, so she asked him his name but he didn't respond. There was no chart so she went and asked the officer on duty with her where the guy's chart was. The officer basically thought she was messing with him because no one had been in that cell for a few days. She went back to the cell with the officer and there was no one there. None of the other staff knew what she was talking about and nothing was on the security footage. My mom is the most secular, scientific person I know and it really freaked her out. She didn't like being alone anywhere in the jail after that.
My dad was a cop in New York City for years. One night he's called to an apartment building where a man has seemingly passed out, possibly from a heart attack, he was also a paramedic. Him and his partner show up and the wife answers the door and takes them into the apartment. The guy is sitting in his chair in the living room completely unconscious. They figure out it's not a heart attack and it's low blood pressure so they're about to administer something to him and suddenly he jumps up and stares at them. However, he wasn't really staring at them, more behind them, like he didn't even know they were there. He then began pacing back and forth, speaking in some sort of tongue, screaming and pointing, like it's a scene in a war movie where the general is inspiring his troops before they go into battle. He's waving his hand, pumping his fist, chanting, shouting his head off, and not a single person in the room had any idea what was going on. Then, just as suddenly as it began, he sits back in his chair and passes out again. When he came to they asked him if he spoke any language other than English, which he didn't. His wife yelled at him that they'd met in Spanish class but he admitted he didn't remember much of it. He said no one in his immediate family spoke any language either, as they'd all been born in America. My dad and his partner left, believing that they had just seen an episode of a previous life taking over the current body in an attempt at self-preservation. My dad tells it better and I figure I messed up a few points but that's more or less the gist of it. A story from Russia. The father of my girlfriend was a voluntary cop. It's like your American deputy, but with less authority. Those guys handle small stuff like walking on public lawns or a drunkard singing in the street. It was evening. They got a report that people are having an illegal gathering in the city park. He went there to check, and found only two rather big families celebrating a wedding. He wished them good luck and went back, but decided to cut short route through the old cemetery. The cemetery is of times of World War II, and no new graves were made since then. One old man kept half an eye over it for a small salary, and it was a rather tranquil old place. It was dark already, so our hero walked fast along the main road, when he saw the gravekeeper. Old man was fixing a fence that was damaged by a fallen branch. Rather far from him there was his cart, full of gardening tools. Our hero decided to pull a prank on the gravekeeper. He sneaked to the cart, took one of the litter bags, cut two holes in it for eyes, with pocket knife, and put it over his head and torso. Then he sneaked up to the gravekeeper, turned on a lighter under the bag, so that lights shine from the eyes, and started wailing. The gravekeeper turned around slowly, stared at him for a minute, turned away and continued his work. Our hero was so confused by the lack of effect. He started to feel bad for his childish behavior. He pulled off the bag, mumbled sorry man and walked fast towards the exit. At the very gates of cemetery, he heard running footsteps behind him. It was the gravekeeper, who run up to him, poked him painfully with a spade and shouted, How many times do I tell you, people, wander around, if you need, but don't leave the territory. An elderly lady phoned 911 and requested that they send some policemen down to her house because she saw a shadowy figure lurking in her backyard. She was living by herself at night and didn't feel safe watching someone through her window. When the policeman arrived, the door was unlocked. They walked in and found the lady seated facing the window and they went to go check the backyard. There were no signs of anyone attempting to break and enter and nothing was missing. She had very tall fences surrounding her property, making it nearly impossibly for anyone to get into it. They did however, find footprints on the inside of her home. It was quite possible that she had left the door unlocked and wasn't looking outside, but rather at a reflection of someone inside of her home, behind her. I'm not a cop. But I did ask a cop about the scariest thing he ever witnessed. This guy had been around for years and a Vietnam vet. He was working homicide and got a call that there was a apparent man who took the easy way out, 
but since it was done with a shotgun they needed to be sure he really shot himself. When he arrived some other officers had been there a while and it was a bloody mess. The guy put the barrel in his mouth and sprayed the ceiling with his skull. He walked over to the body and looked into the gapping hole in the man's skull. Just then the man grabbed him and jumped up and screamed in his face. The slug the guy used managed to go between both lobes of his brain and not kill him. No one checked if he was alive because he looked very dead. He actually was rushed to the hospital and made it. Cop told me that was the only time in his adult life he shit himself. Thought he came back from the dead for a moment. Didn't happen to me, but I responded and was there shortly thereafter. A co-worker responds for a building check located at the city pool. Middle of summer, warm night, it was sometime around 1 AM. The pool is a simple block building on the edge of town, surrounded by a large empty field on one side, a parking lot, playground and trees on the other. Coworker keys up radio and says X pool, I got one running toward the field, unknown male, blue jeans, gray shirt. We all on shift go quickly of course. We find our coworker not far from where the foot pursuit began. He's literally looking at the ground, into the sky, everywhere in that empty field. Retracing his steps. Mumbling incoherently. We ask where the suspect was last seen and he just keeps repeating we turn the corner of the building and he disappeared. Gone. Now, with the layout of the grounds, if you turn the corner of the building you have the option of running toward the large empty field, or scaling the 10 fence into the pool area. That's it. Nowhere else to go and you cannot climb the building. We check the pool, and surrounding grounds, nothing. Coworker swears he was on the guy's heels, guy disappeared for a split second turning the corner, coworker clears the building corner and suspect has disappeared. Judging by the coworker's statement an absolute astonishment slash fear in his eyes. He's seen something not of this world. Maybe he was chasing some Usain Bolt of trespassers, I dunno. To this day he says he chased an alien. Case still unsolved. I was 19 and a volunteer EMT. We got a 911 dispatch call to a house that's been abandoned for well over 15 years. Police fire and EMS shows up. Police sweep the house and say it's clear. So EMS, myself and captain go in, we go upstairs to the top floor of this farm out and it's extremely cold, the temperature outside had to be ADF. Oddly enough, the window's wide open. So I slam it shut, this window took some effort being as old as it was to close, and looking out at the fire truck and ambulance in clear view in the driveway. He asked me what the noise was, so I told him I just shut the window that was open. We checked crawl spaces, closets, basement which also had an eerie feeling of death in, there were shackles on the pillar, I guess it was for farm animals when being butchered? At least that's what a firefighter told us. We then proceed outside and my captain says I thought you closed that window? Looking up at it. I said I did. Who opened it? So I go back inside expecting someone to still be in there and it was empty. So I simply close the window once more, check the window too to see if it's spring loaded and maybe I didn't close it properly, nope, typical sliding window. So shut once again I went downstairs and back out. The window still shut I looked up and saw a man in a plaid shirt put his hand to the window and once I focused, he was gone but easily decipherable that it was a white male in late fifties with short black hair. So I thought nothing of it. It bothered me when I got bored and daydreamed. I began to do a little research on the property about who owns it and if anyone lived there. To my surprise a friend of mine said his uncle lived there his whole life on the farm. He was the last one to pass away in the home. The uncle lived with his parents which they passed years prior also in home. So I asked my friend if he was late fifties, short black hair and died upstairs, his face dropped and he said yes. He passed away from diabetes, he did not take his insulin and was found dead by his brother a few days later. After that, 
I look into that window every day driving by saying a prayer on my way to work. I was driving along a quiet industrial road one night. It had been a fairly quiet night which was rare and I was having a good time. I was thinking about a lot of things. It was the holiday season and I was considering what kind of gifts to get for my kids. They were in their late teens, so buying gifts for them not only became more difficult but increasingly more expensive. I remember I still chuckled at the idea of getting them cheap water pistols like I used to do when they were much younger. That was when I drove by a building with the alarm system going off. I looked at the name on the building and looked up the owner's details. I phoned him and he said that the building had been empty for years and that there was nothing left inside there for anyone to steal. I told him that was all fine but he still needed to come and open up for me, as I was worried that vagrants might have been trying to set up camp inside. I waited a few minutes and a disgruntled man showed up unhappy about needing to be there so late at night. It was around 3 AM. When I entered the building. The first thing I did was walk with the owner from door to door to make sure that none of them had been broken. Then I wanted to check and clear every floor. The building owner had to come with me as I didn't want him waiting outside in the dark. It wasn't a safe area and I didn't want him to get robbed. The building had seven floors in total. And we were slowly making our way up each floor. Eventually the owner got frustrated and asked me if I really thought that a vagrant would climb that many stairs just to find a place to sleep. I explained to him that I've seen them go through more effort than that to get comfortable. Also, there were only two floors left, we might as well have finished it. When we got to the seventh floor I noticed immediately that there was a cool breeze that wasn't in the rest of the building. I asked the owner if that was normal and he just shrugged. So I went about clearing all the rooms. When we entered the third or fourth room, I noticed a freshly broken window. I pointed it out to the owner and he shrugged it off, saying it was likely just a bird that broke it. He was getting really annoyed with me at this point because I had forced him to go all the way out there in the dead of night to check through a building he didn't seem to care about anymore. But as an officer my gut was telling me to keep going, and I never ignore my gut. When we got to the last room, the largest room, I used my flashlight. The owner got frustrated and just flipped on the lights illuminating the entire room. That's when I heard the loudest screech I've ever heard in my life. It was coming from the far corner of the room. We looked up in that direction and saw a large dog-like creature running through the space. It had patchy white fur and large ape leg arms and feet. Then it threw its body straight through the window. I waited to hear a thud on the ground, but it never came. We bolted back down the seven flights of stairs and around the building to where the creature would have landed. But we found nothing. All I found were some fresh tracks in the garden beds leading away from the building. The building owner started freaking out and before I could stop him he ran to his car and drove away. I tried to call him a couple of times to ask him to come back but he wouldn't take my call. I immediately jumped into my car, locked the doors and called for backup. A team of people arrived and we searched the building once more as the owner had left it open. Then we searched the nearby surrounding area for the creature. We couldn't find anything. It was an industrial area so the creature could have been absolutely anywhere. The report I filed is still sitting in a filing cabinet somewhere being forgotten about. But I know for sure that neither me nor the owner of the building could possibly forget that encounter. I never enter buildings alone anymore. I don't know what I'll do if I ever see something like that again. Not a cop but a juvenile detection center. While I was on night shift 11 pm to 7 am I would basically make rounds and watch TV. Nothing happened because all the kids were sleeping. There were occupied cells except for one. I asked why this one was never filled and my supervisor said because every kid that stayed in there felt uneasy sleeping and something would grab their hand. Of course I said okay well whatever. So while making my rounds and checking on the kids to make sure they were sleeping and not goofing off slash staying awake, I checked through the window on this door. To this day I still wouldn't look in there unless it was occupied. 
I saw a bed with a pitched blanket on it. Mind you the cell was empty and closed and I know for a damned fact there wasn't a blanket and there only a mattress the day before when I was watching the same cell block. So I called the acting supervisor and I said you gotta see this. He comes down and sees the blanket now on the floor. And I said I'm telling you it was pitched up like a tent and I know there wasn't a blanket in there yesterday. And he said point blank, why do you think you were in this cell block and no one else? They knew I was new of course and gave me cell block D which they nicknamed Doom. Because the worst kids were here and it was haunted. Would have been nice on orientation day to have learned that beforehand. I used to work overnight in a hospital and creepy things happen all time. Call lights going off in unoccupied rooms, footsteps behind me in long dark halls, the smell of weird perfumes when no one is around. And those are just the little things. One night I heard my coworker call for me. I came around the corner to the nurse's station and she's MIA. I assume she had to run something to a room. I go about my rounds, and when I finally run into her, ask her what she needed. She said she didn't need anything, that she'd been on break and never said my name or called out to me. I argued for a few minutes until I realized she had no reason to lie. But I heard it plain as day. Still creeps me out when I think about it. Another place you want to avoid at night is the morgue. I worked in a 300-year-old hotel for a couple of years in Ireland. Huge manor house owed by some of the richest people in Ireland back in the 1650s I think. When we have guests stay we don't really tell them any of the spooky stories unless they ask are there any or if it's meant to be haunted. It's known that many years ago a rich man lived in the house with his kids. Now one of his kids was said to be troubled, apparently she was locked in her room because of this as punishment for days. She eventually jumped out the window of her bedroom which was on the highest floor of the house and didn't survive. Fast forward to a couple of years ago when I started. I heard a story once I started that a man was found by housekeeping under his covers absolutely terrified one morning. He was on about a woman in his room in the middle of the night, walk over to him and sit on the end of his bed. This was also the room that belonged to the girl from the story. Now as a firm non-believer in the supernatural I saw it as a story and nothing more since I wasn't working when it happened. However fast forward again to when I was working in the hotel. As a small hotel, 35 rooms, we know the names of the people staying, where they're from and how many kids they have staying with them if any. One morning a woman came down to reception to complain about kids running around the top floor of the hotel all night and screaming. We just looked at her and said we have no children staying in the hotel that night. Fourteen years as a mobile security guard. I was patrolling a private school that was only five years old at the time. This school was new and went from kindergarten through to year 12, Queensland, Australia. For a few months we got movement sensor alarms from the prep classrooms, first year of formal schooling. They consisted of two classrooms with a central kitchen and staff rooms. For us guards we would enter through the staff area and had a short hallway with a door at either end to the classrooms. We normally did the internal check. Find nothing. Put it down to the aircon blowing some of the artwork hanging on string in the classroom. Reset the alarm and go on our way. This night I head into the hallway and turn to the right side door. I open it and step into the room to have a black shape like a bat fly straight at my head. I dodge out of the way and end up on my arse without anything actually hitting me. All doors were shut all windows closed. I searched and found nothing. But never had another alarm from that building for the next four years I patrolled it. I did however a few years later while driving around the school notice a set of legs walking across the admin building roof. The car park lights were on behind the building so there is a glow of light clearly outlining the building. This shadow of legs to the hips is walking across the roof peak with. No way that I can work out how or what the shadows could be from.
Not a cop or law enforcer, but I worked at a funeral home all throughout college. I don't usually believe in the paranormal, but there were a couple times I questioned it. There is this one time that stands out more than any other experience. Usually when I was working, it was to work after normal funeral home hours at a viewing slash rosary. This usually meant I was there until dark by myself. Our funeral home was also an old house that always gave me a creepy vibe. My routine for closing was to turn up all the lights, make sure the crematory was off slash clean with no one in there, close any open caskets, transfer the phones, and lock the door. There was this one time I was in a viewing room turning off all the lights. It was a mid-forties man in one of our viewing rooms. Now normally an embalmed body has their eyelids shut. Our funeral home used what amounts to sticky contacts that would hold the eyes shut. As I was turning off the last light out of the corner of my eye I saw the light reflecting off of an eyeball. This is nearly impossible and made all the hair stand up on my neck. I turned around and I swear on my parents grave it looked like that man was looking right at me. He had the glassy eyes of a dead person and his mouth was still sewn with a slight smile. His head was turned slightly and his eyes were wide open. Instead of being the good funeral home employee and checking it out, I sprinted out of there. I immediately called my boss and told her what I saw. She said to not worry about closing the casket but to transfer the phones and go. She didn't believe a word I said. Going back in was tough. As I was in the front office, I was holding the phone shaking and continually checking around the corner for anything. I was so scared I called my roommate while I finished transferring. Didn't open the next day. They checked the body and nothing was off. His eyes were shut and his neck wasn't rotated. My boss made fun of me for a good couple of months after that. I can't explain what I saw but it could have been due to tiredness or my brain playing tricks in the dark. Either way, I will never forget that experience. I'm not in law enforcement or fire slash rescue or anything like that. I'm a plumbing contractor and got a call from some homeowners about a bad smell in their house. They were trying to sell the house but were having no luck because prospective homeowners noticed the odor when they entered the master bath. I show up at the site thinking it's a broken vent or main sewer line and the smell is sewer gas or raw sewage coming up from the crawl space. When I entered the home I couldn't smell anything until I got in the master bathroom and then it hit me. It wasn't quite a sewer gas smell. It smelled more like raw sewage mixed with grease trap grease that had been sitting out in the sun on a 90 degree day. I asked the homeowner how to get in the crawl space as I didn't see an access from the outside. The man said he didn't know and had never had to go down there. I started searching the bedroom closets for an access and found one in one of the homeowner's daughter's room. It was under the carpet and screwed and nailed shut. Here's where it gets freaky. The little girl, whose room the crawl access was in, was watching me as I took up the carpet and was taking out the nails and screws from the access door. She turns to her dad, when I was almost done removing the screws and nails, and frantically starts telling him not to let him out. The dad assumed she was talking about not letting me out and started telling her I wasn't leaving I was just going under the house. She literally broke down crying and screaming the homeowner apologized and took her out of the room. When I finally got the access door open, the smell about knocked me out. It was terrible. I climbed down in the crawl and worked my way towards the master bath. There was no broken main, no broken vent, no sewage on the ground. In the corner there was a large black trash bag and when I opened it it was full of whole animal carcasses and old old bottles of embalming fluid. Freaked me the F out. I hauled ass out of there and told them they'll need to call some kind of hazardous waste disposal company to come in and get rid of whatever the hell was down there. I didn't even charge the people I just got the hell out. A few weeks later I got a call from the same people wanting some minor repairs done in the kitchen so they could sell. The homeowner said after I left the smell completely went away and they had a handyman remove the bag of animal bones they said that had to be the cause of the smell but it had went away before the bag was removed and last time I checked, bones don't smell like that. 
never found out what the little girl meant by let him out and never went back there. I was back visiting my parents in my early 20s, we've always had a tumultuous relationship. That night I got into an argument with my mom, I was in a bad place mental health wise and was also in an abusive relationship. Just a really low place. I was reaching out for emotional support from my parents and not getting it, basically. After my mom and I argued I went to bed in my childhood bedroom. It's a big room with a fireplace and two doors you can use to come in. My house was built in 1831 and used to serve as a sort of inn and stop off of the road for travelers. It's always felt full of the presence of people or something, even when you are there alone. Anyway, I go to sleep and have the most awful, violent, messed up dreams. I don't really recall them now but they were just beyond any nightmare I had ever experienced. When I woke up the next day I was soaking wet like I had been sweating all night. I noticed as I was sitting up that my back felt sore, but didn't think anything of it until I took my soaked shirt off. My back was covered in these long scratches, all in sets of three. One set was scratched up almost the entire length of my spine. There were also small bruises concentrated in my mid-back area and one of my shoulders. The scratched kind of felt like cat scratches, kind of burned in the same way, but they weren't raised up and puffy like cat scratches. I took a photo of it if anyone is curious. It still freaks me out to this day. I always kept those bedroom doors closed and there weren't any animals in the house at the time. I also searched all over the bed and there wasn't anything sharp. This was the worst experience of the scratching I ever had, but it wasn't the only time. After that first incident it happened several other times just to a lesser degree. Always with small little bruises. Generally when I'm very stressed and not in a good place in my life. Would love to know what causes it. Many years ago, when my now 28-year-old daughter was still an infant. Me, her, and our dog were at the apartment we were living in at the time. My wife was at work, I was sitting on the couch watching TV, my daughter was asleep on a blanket pallet on the floor, and the dog, a German Shepherd, wolf hybrid mix, was about 10 feet away laying in the doorway between our kitchen and the living room area. At any rate, I was watching whatever it was that I was watching when all of a sudden, Thor, our dog, starts with this low level, guttural growling. I figured that he had heard someone in another apartment or walking by through the parking lot and don't think much of it. As a few seconds pass, I notice that it's getting louder and I can see out of the corner of my eye that he has lifted his head up off his paws, his ears are perked, and he's looking up at the ceiling over where my daughter was laying. I look up, don't see anything, tell him to knock it off. Right after I tell him to knock it off, he jumps up, starts circling my sleeping daughter, literally walking around the pallet she's laying on, and growling more and more intensely even stopping once and outright snarling and snapping his teeth. All while staring up at the ceiling. After about two minutes of this, and me having no clue on what to do since I can't see anything and I do not want to reach for my daughter with him circling her like that. He laid down next to my daughter, rested his head on her back, and stayed there for almost an hour. Still intently staring up at the ceiling and occasionally growling. To this day, I have no idea what the hell was going on or what he saw, sensed. But it was extremely creepy to me. Not a cop but I do overnight security in a hospital. One night we got a call from the operator that someone was making phone calls from an abandoned part in the hospital. Now this part of the hospital has absolutely no one in it whatsoever during night shifts so it already raised some red flags for us. I should also mention that whenever I do rounds in this section I always feel like someone is watching me. Anyway. So we get the call so me and my supervisor head over and check out the entire area, check all doors, closets, etc. Eventually my supervisor opens this lone closet and sees this weird looking voodoo like doll propped up in the closet with an old school dial telephone in the closet with it. 
The next night the doll was in a different location. A family member of mine worked security at the Dayton Mall in Ohio for many years. He told me, a major ghost slash paranormal skeptic, a story and showed me security footage that gave me goosebumps and made my hair stand on end. From his point of view, about 14 years ago, a fellow security guard is patrolling overnight, 24 hours security on site, and when he's in one of the hallways that goes behind all the shops he sees a man, plain as day and totally normal looking, run through the hall. He chases after the guy, as obviously no one is supposed to be in the mall except security, and finally gets into the same stretch of hallway as the man. The security officer says that the guy opened the supposedly locked back door to one of the stores that has a roll-down cage in front and go in, closing the door behind him. Security officer follows, gets to the door, and finds it locked. Thinking the guy just locked it behind him, and being armed with only handcuffs, the security officer calls in Miami Township Police since the guy is cornered in the locked down store. Police arrive, make their way to the door, security officer unlocks the door, police announce themselves and go in. Nothing. No evidence of any person being in the shop. Everything is still locked up and the shop is cleared. Now for the footage. My family member showed me the footage from the hallway of the shop's back door. The man runs on screen first, right up the door, opens and closes it. Except this man is nothing but a bright ball of light. As I was watching, I tried to explain it away and say oh it's just the camera acting up, but not two seconds later, the security officer shows up on screen and looks totally normal. There have been a few murders and several deaths in general at and around this particular mall, and I imagine most malls in general, so I'm not sure if that contributes, but this is the one instance of a ghost story that was believable to me. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.